variety of degree works ranging from the categories of three seeds of concept, context, and culture. All right, a little insight. Okay, so sorry, there was a glitch or probably a technical problem. You couldn't hear the audio. So let me start over again. Take two. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning on our last day of So Am I C exhibition. We are excited to host the last day with you guys and are glad that all of you guys are all awake early this morning. This event will not be possible without all of you. So without further ado, a very big welcome to Class 2019's Graduates Exhibition, So Am I C, Day 3. It is the first ever in history of Taylor's Graduates Exhibition for us to host this event virtually. My name is Lindsay and I will be your MC for today. Okay, it's the last day and I see, I don't see a lot of you, maybe you guys are still sleeping, but um, hi Nick, hi Shannon, um, good day to all. Oh, hi Tia, so excited there. Um, just a reminder, you can always, always comment down below if you have any questions or just want to say hi to our team and our team will definitely revert back to you. So just a short run through. So MIC is an architectural platform in which graduates from the School of Architecture would display their diverse works from the degree years. So MIC, the title of our exhibition and concept is an anagram of the word mosaic, which frames the theme of our exhibition parts that makes up a whole. You guys can always head on to our website, taylorsartgrad.com, to view a variety of degree works ranging from the categories of the three C's of concept, context, and culture. So make sure you head on to the website. So a little insight for today's agenda. It is our last day of some exciting programs. We have A.R. Kawarizmi, Dr. Noor Hisham, speaking on tips on architecture competitions in a while. And at 11 a.m., we have Lim Eugene touching on the topic of cost, comics, corrector, and CAD. After that, we have another informal sharing session by the alumni, Ryan, Sharon, Shannon, and Coyd at 11.40 a.m. And then ending our day with a closing ceremony and a live performance by Adam and Hanif. How exciting. But just to up the little excitement this morning, it is your last day to join our lucky draw to win some of our amazing prizes. All you need to do is head on to our Instagram at SoMIC underscore and hit a follow. Then snap an IG story of our live talks or any performances or even right now and tag us at SoMIC underscore. And that's it. How simple is that? Make sure you don't miss out this opportunity to win some of the amazing prices. In addition, one of our supposed vendors, Baba Bros, a food truck that serves Italian food has sponsored some coupons to be given away as well. So if you are lucky, you can get a 50 ringgit voucher off your meal on your next visit. Okay, I hope you are sprinting your fingers on our Instagram page right now. While you're doing that, let me introduce to you our first speaker of today, A.R. Kawarizmi Noor Hisham, who has personally won over 40 plus competitions to date at various peers, providing you the secrets behind architecture competition. I know many in our field are very involved in challenging ourselves by joining competition. So this talk will be highly beneficial to many of you. Introducing to you A.R. Kawarizmi Noor Hisham. He is a firm believer in this continuous discipline of honing the craft of design thinking. He is obsessed in simulating the paradoxical state of intervening layers of scenarios with the social psych. He runs multiple practices as director of Practica Architects, 
the principal of Carl Rismi, architect and partner of research think tank NDRXA. He is very knowledgeable in understanding the ideal needs, aids, and architecture competition. So lucky for you guys, you are in for a good treat as he is going to provide you a complete set of a cheat sheet for your next architecture competition. So without further ado, let me introduce to you A.R. Kawarizmi nor Hisham, who will be speaking on the topic of tips on architecture competition. So make sure you have your pen and paper ready to jot down all the cheat sheet. All right, let's give a virtual round of applause to A.R. Kawarizmi nor Hisham. Hi, hello, hi, hello. Good morning. Thank you, Lindsay. Good morning, everyone. Hi. All right, so um, we're all very excited to have you on board here today. So without further ado, the whole platform is yours. Do you mind sharing your screen with us as well? Sure, sure. So good morning, everyone. And thank you to So MIC, uh, the Taylor's University uh, Architecture Graduate Exhibition 2020. I'm uh, really pleased to share this with the students today, and I hope it will be beneficial to you. So the title of my uh, particular sharing is The Secret Sauce, the Recipe to Become Competitive in Architecture Competition. So as you know that uh, I'm, I'm only uh, 30 this year, so I'm not, I don't know much. I don't know everything under the sun. But this list of suggestions is just uh, based on my uh, personal uh, experience and what do I practice. Basically, do take the advice and tips with a pinch of salt. Uh, again, uh, the advice and tip does not apply to everything as a specific competition will uh, have an implied specific scenario. So basically, we have to make sure that you, you make some adjustment uh, to your liking. Uh, first of all, we need to define what is competition. And I think there's a lot of things can be uh, defined as such. But for this particular piece, this particular sharing, I will not include scholarship, award, or recognition as part of competition. If you are not, uh, if you are not familiar, I mean, or uh, need some example to differentiate competition like AYDA, Asia Young Designer Award, which I'm also part of the uh, alumni, is uh, is not a design competition per se because they don't have a specific brief for all participants to respond to. So scholarship, same goes to Pam Johnson Swiss or Pam Bronze Medal or Pam ZSR. All, all of that is award. Award is meant for you to get accredited for you know, doing an excellent work in your field of study. Okay, but design competition meant is that uh, meant you have to design something, okay, and everyone have to design a thing or a project and uh, provide the best solution for that particular uh, problem. So design competition will have a brief that everyone will respond to. So I hope I make it clear. So why do we talk about source? Source is definitely a metaphor of, of uh, creating uh, something unique, uh, something that is uh, slightly better than your competitor. So basically, if you look at uh, uh, you know, uh, entry for design competition, uh, for example, uh, office, so both participant or many participants can design an office, but what makes an office better than the other competition uh, competitors is the extra uh, feature or what we call it source. So it's, 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 uh, the idea was to you know create a nuance big enough so that you can differentiate yourself from the other competitor and eventually uh, win something. So there is certain things that you need to consider before you start uh, your journey. So it's, uh, usually I start with competition selection because you have to ensure that uh, there is some level of uh, balance between the amount of work or risk and the amount of reward or price, okay? So of course, we're gonna cover economics, okay? YOLO, meaning that you only live one, so it's all about time. Intangible costs, other things that might cost you that you might not realize. But as you grow older, older, there's a lot of things that you will, you know, reflect back. As a student, you are very free. You are, you know, you don't have much commitment. So you are free and you think that your time is not that valuable, but it is actually. Transparency, jury selection, and jury methodology. So we go one by one. So you need to make sure that you understood 
the economic factor of it, higher price pool will definitely attract more people and more established and you know serious competitor. So some competition is very light. They just you know uh, people will just enter for the for the sake of having fun, but certain competition will have that gravity of that seriousness. So you have to manage your margin. Of course, I'm operating a small practice, so margin is for me uh, is quite important. So we have to make sure that we have the at least 50x, meaning that if I spend 1,000, it is in uh, what I call it in in a prospect to win 50,000, something like that. So, but 100% x is the be best margin, and I think uh, yeah, it's a sort of a unicorn. I haven't seen a project that, that, that uh, no, a, a design competition that offers such uh, margin. And time never recovered. Of course, you only live once. So you have to think about, you know, life. You know, maybe it is better for you to go outside and play or, you know, have fun rather than doing competition because you have to think about uh, if you didn't win anything or if you, you know, uh, put your hearts out and eventually did not achieve what you want to achieve, eventually you you are in this voyage of nothingness uh, eventually uh, you will feel disappointed or demotivated so try to select a competition that you think a good ratio uh, of time can be spent to produce a good result so you know you can be satisfied with what you produce and of course there's other intangible costs your morale your health of course this is like on top of your uh, typical uh, daily routine you still need to do your you know work or school and on top of that you are putting yourself imposing yourself another layer of work so you need to take that into account and of course you're not going to have time to spend with your loved ones so all this have to be uh, thought of uh, mathematically speaking uh, this is just an example let's say there is a hundred and three so basically, usually 30% of them will, you know, fade out due to the fact that they lost, lost interest or they didn't submit on time or basically they totally forgo uh, the intention to enter. And basically out of that bona fide, and bona fide means a legit entry. So usually 10% of them is a competitive uh, competitor. Again, you have to look at the price money. Uh, to the what what range if uh, they uh, allocate winners do they have like honorable mention or they have silver or bronze or something like that and then try to gauge with the amount of people that actually enter and then you can do your own mathematic if you can you know be in that particular top 10 percent because at the end of the day if you just make like a uh, like a, a submission that you think that it might might go through, but let's say uh, the amount of competitive competitor after you 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 do your calculation is twenty, okay, and then the winning price is only five. There's only five winners. So you know, even though you are in the winner's circle, you know you are one of the you know good good entry, but your chance is still uh, far off. So you need to consider that as well. Transparency. Look for red flags because there's a lot of uh, pseudo competition. I myself has competition that I entered that has no conclusion. It means that you submit and eventually they say they will be announced, uh, they will be judged, but eventually it just fades out. And when you ask them, it's not, it's no longer in, in their view, uh, the competition just die off. So your work uh, is just wasted away. So you need to think about that as well. Reputation of the organizer is, is definitely a thing uh, to look at. Jury selection, of course, you know, you you have to note that some competition do tell, uh, do inform who are the jury, but of course, uh, sometimes they do change it, uh, uh, you know, prior to to judging, according to availability as well. Uh, this is a problem because sometimes you try to suit your work to the judges, but I don't think that's the best strategy because judges might change. So as, as, as I ex have experienced myself, uh, they do have the you know, clause that you know, prior to judging, if they are not available, they might change it to other person. So it's better to make sure that the work speaks of your personality rather than the personality of the jury. And jury methodology is again another way for you to gauge how much work you have to do. 
you know, some is fairly uh, opaque. Opaque means, you know, not, not transparent. They're not going to tell you how they are judging. So it's a silent evaluation. Then eventually they announce. Remote evaluation is that they are living overseas or they're living in different locality. They've been just given the file and you can just look at it and try to, they will try to evaluate from your, from your work from computer screen. Or social, social media voting, obviously. Physical voting, of course, there is some physical voting. Sometimes in malls, depends on, on what kind of competition. Two-stage evaluation, meaning that there will be a submission. And once you manage to get through to the shortlisted one, you need to resub, you know, submit further information. So there's two stages of evaluation. Sometimes they allow you, sometimes competition require for a verbal presentation and Q&A or sometimes workshop. So you need to gauge for this amount of, um, you know, prize money. Not, not trying to being so materialistic, but it's just that for a small company, we can't afford to, you know, splurge uh, cash. So we need to be uh, uh, consider, considerate in terms of uh, financial viability. So at the end of the day, uh, this is the kind of uh, pseudo uh, formula that I've created for you to evaluate uh, what is your risk to reward factors. So let's say you found a competition that you like. So you are in. Now, what's next? The next thing is to make sure you have a position. Let's say the competition is best potato competition. You can change potato to office, best office competition, whatever you want. So what is your position? Should potato be boiled and mashed or should potato be cut and fried? So you need to you know, uh, take position because it's important to take your project to a direction rather than try to please all aspects of that particular project and eventually end up with no direction. But even with this particular method, uh, uh, this particular direction, you, need, you still need to think about the method. Do you, you know, if you want to fry them, do you deep fry or air fry? If you are doing mash, should it be with bacon bits or with gravy? So even, even that, there's a lot of uh, options. So an uh, example of this is this particular bridge competition. You can see that some people took this elegant route. So it's, uh, the, the design is very elegant. It, it has this uh, continuous uh, flow of curvature. Very nice, uh, very light. Some take it a bit more, uh, you know, it, it looks like an ellipse or it looks like a Mobius strip, sort of, sort of like giving the impression of an infinity loop, stuff like that. Some a bit more adventurous and you know organic, a bit more flamboyant shape. So again, this particular competition is fairly simple, but for you to observe what kind of direction should you, uh, should you go through. And maybe you want to go to more, um, a bit more abstract uh, uh, route. So this is a bit more, uh, of course, this is pedestrian bridge should be a utilitarian structure. But of course, this particular two entries try to uh, give an art or art, art abstract uh, uh, expression. And this is the winner. This is by Hedewigs. This, this is another take of continuously uh, bringing in portion of the park and then make a continuous ribbon from one part of the river to the next. And this is OME's submission. It's a fairly abstract building, uh, abstract in terms of not, not because of the shape, because of the ideals of it should just be a bridge. And it's not even a drawing, I would say. It's, it's just a you know, diagram. So it's, it's, it's up to you. If you want to take it uh, that direction, you might as well. So if you have decided on a direction, now you have to think about how you're going to execute your direction. So I usually do it alone, Rambo. Uh, I usually take six weeks to complete the work, uh, like a competition, because I think uh, I have a slight problem of uh, ensuring the work, uh, you know, uh, to be solidified to a oneself. Uh, it's up to you if you are able to work uh, in a group environment. It's totally up to you. But some sometimes especially when you are not used to work in this particular uh, stressful uh, timeline or deadline, 
too many cooks can spoil the broth. So think about it. I mean, sometimes it's is uh, reductive to have too many people, and sometimes it's good. So it depends on your particular personal preference. Okay. What do you have to submit? So it is the most ideal. If the brief asks for an a perfect apple, you submit a an apple. I mean, it's good. So the the reason why design brief is written is for the judges to compare apple to apple. So if the apple looks, you know, whichever apple that looks the most perfect, that will be or the closest to the brief that will be chosen as the winner. But sometimes, in, I mean, not not uh, in, in in reality, not. Not all submissions are perfect. I mean, some of them address the issue. Some of them has uh, some lacking uh, elements uh, when it's compared to the brief. So another example that we should look at this is John Hudson's uh, Sydney Opera House submission. He's one of the late uh, submitters. He's number two one eight out of two two three. So he just sent twelve sheets of drawings or twelve drawings. Basically, it's not even completed. So the idea was to ensure that the idea direction came through, and completion is not that 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 uh, doesn't weigh that much gravity in a competition, especially idea competition. So basically, it is revived from the ashes, meaning that basically one of the judges, Serenan, took out the uh, submissions uh, from the rejected pile. Because I think it's incomplete or it's slate. There's just a lot of multiple elements that make it, uh, you know, not a viable option. So it's very rejected early on. But eventually, when they look at it, uh, the the submission doesn't bear any inspiration until they look at the rejected pile and found Uzon's uh, drawings. So in Uzon's earlier sketch or drawings, there's no walls. There's very little elements. And basically, you can see it's not particularly rendered. I mean, at that moment of time, obviously, it's manually rendered. So this is how it looks. It's fairly empty. Even the staircase, I mean, you can see the staircase there in front. It's not particularly uh, drawn in detail. There's no staircase riser. You can see it's fairly uh, uh, empty. And basically, you can see the plans are fa fairly simplistic. That, that, that no, not much detail. There is some shadow that he rendered to indicate that is the exterior part of the building. You can see the drop off, and then eventually on the ground, uh, on ground, and then first, and then as you move up to the to the plan, you can see the plan develop. And you look at some of the eleve elevation here. The drawing is fairly simplistic. I think the shell. You can see the shell of the roof is being drawn in a single line uh, drawing. There's no indica indicative of uh, what do you call it uh, thickness, and there's no uh, covering. It's fairly open. There's no walls, but the idea of uh, creating this subsequent series of I don't know uh, dome curvature uh, tangent tangent uh, sphere shape has uh, bring 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 life. Uh, to this particular rejected proposal. So this is the design. You can see the wall is rendered using pencil very lightly, and even the dome should is not uh, rendered to show. You know, uh, it is a covered, 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 covering element. So it's it's fairly sim simplistic. So compared to the rest, is is looks very incomplete. But again, it's inspire. A, 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 a language or a direction where the project wants to go. So this is how the perspective look. I mean, you can see it's fairly abstract. It doesn't really, you know, you can't really imagine this is as, as a, one of the concourse of the opera house, or you know, it's, it's fairly incomplete. It's just highlighting in white the the shell uh, as the main uh, direction or, or or feature of the particular building. And this is how it looks. Of course, everyone knows. So you need to think about this. Uh, having a holistic and complete submission is the best, but doesn't necessarily bear you the best result. It's just the best, you know, in terms of submission. I would say a partial commission as a completion submission versus brief. You can uh, focus on some aspect of the brief, but not all. It still works. So I'm not saying that uh, doing things, uh, you know.
uh, according to the brief is bad. It's just that sometimes it's good to leave some part of it as a mystery. So as as John, so that you are not distracted. So as for John Ozon, definitely is the shell because sometimes in this particular age, uh, uh, sustainable feature has been like a new nuisance like sometimes it took away the gravity of that particular novel idea that you have because it's been diluted by so many ideas at the end of the day it's not focused so sometimes not not complying to all is also good but another approach is totally different offer the submission asks for an apple and you produce a, like a smart wash smart smart watch and anything you know you are offering anything other than the brief so it's, it's sometimes it works sometimes it depends on what is your goal entering of a particular condition or the last one is you can offer a portion of the brief and offer a portion of a new aspect so it's all up to you but this is also you know balance out the risk of this two extreme and uh, each now, when you want to do your work and try to think of idea, you need to think of some layers of uh, ideas. How do you go down to an element from top? So you need to think of like a, a burger or an onion. So like in a burger, right, there's some layers that help you to taste, uh, you know, savory, then, you know, you know, the cheese will come in with sour and then the mayo or Thousand Island will give some sweetness. So the idea is to ensure that you have all this catered. So you have the ability to somehow uh, manage your idea and put them into place. So maybe, for example, in this particular uh, work that we do is that we start with, uh, this is a house co housing competition. We said the house hasn't necessarily uh, been chosen by the buyer, but the buyer is chosen by the house. How they do that is by price. So obviously this is not an architectural issue or architectural question. This is definitely economic or ownership question. So the idea was to, to, to you know, of course you want to talk about the idea of architecture, but architecture is related to so many things. So we talk about this particular subset. And we say that uh, if you own uh, I mean, if you have a, a lot of money and then you can go up, 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 you have a lot of, of uh, offer or options of houses. You can see the colors, uh, let's say uh, the purple is house below 100K and then the turquoise is house below 200K. So as you move forward, you have a lot of options. But for people that is under the 200K can only get the six option as I uh, illustrate here. All these options are different. I mean, you can see that, you know, the design of how they are different, but at the same time, they are also the same. So again, this is not really talking about architecture yet. I'm just talking about the, the market, the property market. So that, and then you can go into a master plan level. So each level should have an idea. So, and then building component level, of course, uh, the architecture level will have one as well. So what you want to ensure is that you address things that is uh, both architecture and not. So basically pseudo choice. They don't actually have a choice because like today, do you want to buy a type A or type B? But type A and type B is the same. The house is, you know, similar in, in, in character. One fit, one, one size fits all. And then some of the architecture uh, issues, living in non-space, you have balcony, all this deep void, all this unnecessarily, uh, you know, inhuman place to, to live in, unnecessarily complicated. So some, some of them will go filtered down to architecture, to physical, but it starts with a bigger picture, then you can go down slowly. So the offer that we want to give is huge range of unit, tailored unit, extremely diverse neighborhood character, and then also efficient geometry. So this is your offer. So your offer not only range, uh, you know, you're not only offering architectural solution, but you're also offering, uh, you know, a way of life, a way of ownership, uh, a way of leasing. So you need to think a bit about that. So instead of this, we can make the bottom 200K a bit more diverse. So they have an actual choice a democratic way to actually choose their house i mean obviously 
in this uh, in this previous model you can see just now they don't actually have a choice they kind of forced to buy this particular product housing product so never do what they ask i think this is also important because if they want something and then they already knew what they want they will just uh, do a you know a commission they can commission someone instead of competition in the competition is a they signal uh, uh, some level of answers, uh, uncertainty. So at least don't don't give them in the form that they want. So as I mentioned, you know, if the competition say, let's say the SOA tell you that, okay, it needs a veggie, it needs a chicken, it needs a rice, and competitors or participants can do fried rice with that, can do porridge with that, can do chicken rice with that. So obviously, uh, this is what they want. But maybe if you, you know, uh, think about it, maybe you could do something totally different, right? Maybe you can turn, turn the rice into chicken. The chicken, you can dice the smaller into the rice. So you can like start playing, you know, with the elements that they gave you and try to offer them something different. So they might expect a, a fried rice, porridge and chicken rice. Then you give them like a like a Frankenstein chicken made of rice and the rice made of chicken and, you know, you tipsy turvy uh, the requirement. For example, uh, I think this is a fairly uh, publicized competition and we enter this uh, with the aim not to win. We purposely want to uh, ensure that we uh, give out a public statement instead of actually winning. So this is how it looks. Other people actually submitted chairs. I mean, logically, because it's a, it is a chair competition. So you can see the range of chairs, which is all excellent. But you can see in number one, there's something wrong there. If you look at look at it carefully on top, number one, you know, we ensure ourselves to register as the first one so that it will be a bit more visible. And you can see the winners, which is the top 20, and eventually uh, the winners. It's all good, a uh, very beautiful chair. So, uh, but we want to argue that KL chair shouldn't be an actual chair, because KL to me is this. When my mom say, we go, let's go to KL, it doesn't mean the town, but it means this particular shopping mall. And of course, this is a place where Berse, uh, red shirt, yellow shirt, whatever shirt you want, guarantee they will have to. Uh, use this as one of the rendezvous point. It is nicely situated in town. It was actually uh, a, a site of uh, social housing that had been brought down and erected a shopping mall on, on top of it. It is where uh, KL lights actually spend their time, sit, mingle, you know, have fun with their family, enjoy their time during the weekend. This is a huge sofa. It's like a KL sofa the Ang Sang Hero, which is the staircase in front of Sogo, this, this curving staircase. So that's what we decide to submit. We decide to submit the staircase. I mean, when the last time uh, you sit on them, I mean, almost all of us have seated on a staircase before. You know, it's not an architectural element designed to conform to the ergonomy of sitting, but it is everywhere and it's convenient. The idea was to ensure that KL chair is not something we design. KL chair is something that is already there in KL and people in KL can afford to sit on. I mean, obviously, designer chair is going to be very expensive. We think that it's not worthy or it's not right to call it KL chair because not all people in KL can afford to live, uh, to sit on it. So we, we say Tangga. Tangga is Kuala Lumpur chair. That's it. I mean, that is the submission. Obviously, we did not submit any uh, a staircase and we just highlight uh, sorry we do not submit any chat and we highlight the staircase in purple that's it and then we try to you know see how it goes uh, fortunately Chris Yap, our dear friend architect Chris Yap, uh, basically post some of the images during the judging you can see they are judging through a folder uh, basically an A3 folder and they are look at it with uh, some level of uh, curiosity what's with the perspective you can read read it through are you sure what it meant to be and at that moment of time club director at that particular year architect ang is you know try to uh, look at 
they work a bit closer and look at our write-up. So definitely we mentioned that it's not a chair, it's really a staircase. Ironically, beside the room is where our uh, proposal is, a series of staircase in FAM Center. I think we won uh, morally uh, because we put forth a genuine intellectual argument of what KL chair should be. And I think that should not be, uh, you know, exclusive designer chair, why not? And it is really the staircase and it is abundance everywhere, including in Pam Center. So uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, I, want, I, I felt like morally I have won. Again, it's, it's you to set your goalposts, okay? If you put too much pressure on yourself, okay? I must win uh, prize money. Okay, maybe you maybe you will or maybe you won't. But again, that that kind of unnecessary pressure, uh, pressure take take out the pleasure of entering competition. Competition is all about discovery, finding yourself, expressing your personality. So maybe if you calibrate, you know your expectation, you can always win. So if your outcome is I want to get first prize, third prize, it's okay. And also, in my particular case, I think money is nice to have. If we want any prize money, okay, it's good. But uh, occasionally, we want to make a statement, just like the example that I show you. And usually, we want to make an introduction. Because some people that are organizing this project definitely didn't know you, and they want to get to know you. That's why they're having, they, they host a competition, so they can get new talents to come in. An example of this is Taman Tugu, uh, gazebo competition we entered a very simple proposal lanzibo as an antithesis of building a gazebo we think that we should not build a gazebo because if we build a gazebo it will take up some of the pristine land so why don't we mold nature instead that's what we argued so if we get 100 percent let's say hypothetical plot of park and we incision part of it and create some volume, eventually everyone can enjoy. So creating the natural outlook of what, uh, you know, encapsulated space is instead of building a hard gazebo. So we try to make it as invisible as possible. We have two type. We just design like a dome, like a, a half dome, and then also a, li a linear module that can be uh, appropriated to any part of the particular site. I presented myself alone. There's no, uh, you know, models or videos. Uh, I think for whom that is entered this competition, I think knew that uh, the competition take a bit longer than usual to, to conclude. Uh, I think a lot of Taylor students uh, entered as well. And actually for, for a year plus, I think the competition has still has not been, uh, the winner has still not, still has not been announced. But the fact that this competition is, uh, of course, Tamatungu is related with Hazana National. They have this uh, design residency. And basically, I went for the interview because of the uh, introduction that I made during the competition. I managed to get an interview session. So from that interview, I managed to uh, uh, get, you know, be one of the uh, recipient of Hazana uh, design residency 2018 so again i might i might not win the gazebo competition but the opportunity that i get is already you know uh, you know again calibrate your your winning what do you mean by winning so uh just uh, after that uh, like a quick phone call uh, interview then like le like less than a week then already i'm already at milan so we have been sent to politecnico di milano and you know, I already felt I want something. We spent a month there, so some of the work that we did during the one month, and basically exhibition at the end. So that's my friend, third uh, from Philippines, and all these other uh, forty other nationalities uh, on this particular urban design workshop. So again, uh, yeah, it feels good to go back to school uh, in a way, but you know, with more uh, interesting. Uh, and a topic to, to dwell with. So after that, uh, we actually won the gazebo first prize. So it's, it's double win. We, we get that opportunity to win abroad. And of course, uh, we also won prize money. Again, uh, putting your expectation in certain ways allow you to be happy whatever the outcome is. Uh, and another thing is you have to ensure that 
uh, you swing the jury as much as possible. Okay, let's say this, the jury say, I don't eat sushi, but your sushi is so good, the jury, you know, eat it. So that's good because you manage to swing one opinion to the next. So if you use a linear scale, let's say, to demonstrate a relative movement, is I think easier. So you can see that if the brief call for an office and the you know what constitute an office let's say is uh, the middle ground okay and on two extreme you have a very good office and on the other extreme on this extreme is not an office at all so a very good office is here so jury preconceived idea of what good office is is here so if you manage to design a very good office you manage to swing him or her that much okay and if you if you took this approach, if you take this direction, it is obviously a safe submission model because you are addressing the issue. But there is an alternative to it. If you go to the other extreme, designing something that is not even an office, okay, it's a risky submission model, but the swing zone, you, if, you, if you succeeded, you managed to swing the jury initial position larger in a way it improve your your uh, potential of winning so yeah so all these tips that i've given you actually there's 11 if you itemize them properly you have to eventually at the end of the day uh, kfc it i mean definitely the secret spice is revealed i mean everyone know about the 11 herb and spices used in kfc the question the big question mark is not the spice it's not the tip the big question mark is the balance eventually you you know that the final recipe will be always a secret not secret because i don't want to tell you it's secret because it's meant for and it is meant to be tailored to suit the individual taste of a particular participant so it's totally up to you the recipe might not be the same you might take risk on tips number three but you will forego tips number two you might you know, go full force on tips number four and five, but you might forego tips number eight. So totally up to you. The mix is for only you to know. It's about creating a fragile balance to hit the taste palette of ju the jury. So you have these condiments and you have to put into this, this uh, sauce. You want to create your secret sauce and that will be your entry. And bigger swing will, hi will have higher Im impact and in irresistible, in irresistible taste will definitely make jury remember your submission. Yeah, but uh, I always uh, promote uh, uh, AYDA as, as I'm also an uh, alumni of it. I think it's a good, uh, credible, uh, co uh, you know, award, uh, award competition, whatever. But again, uh, it, it, it doesn't have a specific brief. The brief is very generic. And this particular particular year is forward human centric design. Uh, for our design work, we usually try to document them and try to make it uh, available to public. So usually we uh, produce manifesto to uh, manifesto uh, series under MDRXA to somehow uh, share our perspective of a particular uh, competition design entry and basically try to uh, make it a bit more accessible because it's quite hard to sometimes uh, to read between the lines. So it's all written there it's with, with full text and images and you can get them from our you know, website or Shopee. Of course, a shameless uh, promotion a bit, a bit more. Uh, you can follow some of the, you can follow our channel, Kaurizmi Architect channel, uh, YouTube channel. There's a lot of, uh, most of the entry, uh, video entry is actually Competi uh, competition, either they win something or not, is is totally a different story. Some some of them want something, some of them don't. Don't, and we also engage with uh, public if we can through our podcast QWA podcast on Spotify and YouTube. So the idea of conversation of a particular topic continues uh, on air as well. I think that's all. Thank you so much. I will pass back uh, this particular session to Lindsay, the MC to proceed to the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Take care. Hi, hi. Hello. Uh, oh. Hello? Can you hear hello, me? Hello, hello. Yep. 
Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm very glad to be able to jot down all these amazing tips and tricks for my next architecture competition. Uh, well, it really changed my perspective on how to approach a competition. And I also saw in your slide that you joined Taman Tugu Renovation Competition. No wonder right. you look so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> because, you entered yeah, that too? Yeah, yeah. My team right. and I and other uh, Taylor students uh, attended the interview session as well. It was mm -hmm. quite a long period of time, right? I Correct. Think. One year right, plus, right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, anyways, I enjoyed your analogies and all of your slides. Um, thank you so much for being so generous with your knowledge and experience. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in on the topic's interest, so we will jump into that if you're okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, the first question is, um, what are your thoughts on paid competition? Mm -hmm. I answer now. Direct. Okay, so basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, as you can see, I'm Muslim. Uh, kind of like no-brainer, right? Because of my name, obviously. Uh, you can see that uh, in, in Islam, there is a portion where you have to ensure that it's not a gamble. So, for example, if it's a paid competition, right? And the, 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 the idea of the competition is not... Uh, truthful or honest to find the best solution, but rather to make profit out of other people's wow. work. So that is uh, ethically not, uh, you know, not not uh, not good. I would say for us, uh, we usually found these competitions are not vi uh, financially viable because you have to put your effort and paid money to to enter. But at the end of the day, the upside is usually very low. I'm I'm. I think this particular question is referring to online uh, competition, right? I think mm. the price usually 3,000 euro or 2,000 USD. Usually it does not, uh, you know, have a good uh, risk to reward ratio. Usually when we do our analysis, we found out that uh, maybe uh, wow. the, the upside is not, uh, is not uh, directly proportional to, to to the amount. So if a competition is meant to make money out of entry uh, entry fee, it is actually forbidden, I would say, in a way. I'm not trying to be religious. I'm just saying uh, it's, it's a morally and ethically uh, you know, ambiguous area. But if you want to start, okay, if you want to start uh, uh, you know, yourself doing competition and you found a subject that you think you are familiar with, and it happened to be a paid one, then you have to ask yourself if you really want to do it, go ahead. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm just saying that we are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, not participating in such. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'm not against it. Yeah. But we are not doing it. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Good thought. Um, okay. Second question is, when entering architectural competitions, do big, bold, abstract designs tend to win over subdued, contextual, and thoughtful design? What's a good example of a balance between both? Okay. Bold design uh, might get you to the door. Okay. Meaning that you might reach that with bold design, but thoughtful, thoughtfulness and hum, humane, uh, human factors or human uh, uh, experience will get you to the uh, finish line. What I'm trying to say is some competition mm -hmm. will, will, have, will be so popular, the jury will have to select your work through their screen of, or thumbnail of the screen, right? So when yeah. they go through and, and like say 500 entry and they, they, they've been given the task to shortlist 20, they will not like try to read your text, even though mm -hmm. you have a very uh, you know profound uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, motivation or concept. They will not be able to appreciate that. So the first round to get to the door where the competition is, you need to have some level of uh, in, not 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 bold in terms of like funny shape, but striking impression. I would say. So if you get there by using that striking impression and you can substantiate with, with uh, you know, with a meaning and deeper connection uh, at the uh, details of the text, then you are good to go. See, I think same goes to people, right? I mean, we find mm -hmm. someone physically attracted first. I mean, we don't think about, I mean, of course, we don't know where she come from, the family, blah, 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 blah. So we just, you know, based on that physical attraction, then we get to know them early on. So because we have so millions of people, we need a method to sort out that people. So we 
you know use use that as a means so same goes to competition jury yeah right. understood understood okay now a uh, third question is what should we focus given a live design brief where less than 7 72 hours to create a design solution site visits and analysis are limited meaning lesser understanding or extractions from the site yep so usually we use site as a means of like a crime scene we try to find hints and clue on site to inform mm. our decision of what kind of architecture it should be i think i i, I know what what this question referring to i know there is such competition that they give you brief and then they need something in 24 hour and 72 right. hours yeah but i think in this particular case you just need to have a broad knowledge of you know everything else meaning that maybe some some a bit uh, you know some knowledge on space exploration some knowledge on transportation so that you can respond immediately i think in this particular case is not about creating the correct architecture because obviously no nobody in the right mind wants to you know find the best solution or correct or, or you know relevant architecture in a particular context with such timeline so definitely this timeline this absurd timeline is given just for you to throw the first thing that come to your mind so you know do that try to be a bit more honest not not trying to find something good all the time but sometimes you can you know splurge your ego your personality because definitely this is what they actually want uh, uh, this 72 hour challenge or whatever short term challenge so just mm-hmm. just go with the flow and then whatever come first thing come to your mind you can just you know uh, express that mm, okay thank you so much um for the For our last question is when presenting to live juries how do you construct the best argumentative case for them to be swayed especially when you're doing something so controversial okay so lindsay i want to ask you did you did you uh, one of the presenter during your group um, i of... i wasn't the presenter yeah right, wasn't right. <laughs> so but, but i'm not did you manage to get the uh, verbal presentation stage yes Okay, you do. So, uh, you been. You, do you remember that they give you only three minutes? Yes, yes. Did you exceed that, or your group exceed that? No, we we kept it to the time limit. Okay, so basically, uh, that is one of the you know the thing that you need to understand. You might felt mm-hmm. like you might felt like you only you know sucking the three minutes time from them, but they actually have to judge other twenty right. 10 right, bench correct. 10 gazebo so you need to be considerate to them so it is always good if you have a live judge uh, to keep uh, respect their time and try mm-hmm. to make something uh, what do you call it uh, make some okay for example uh, the 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 presentation that that I did for for the three minutes I didn't even uh, talk about uh, my particular design what I what I said to them is that I'm sure today This is exactly what I said. I'm sure today you have seen other nine good gazebo design. And I said to them, I'm happy with any of those nine if if they've been built in Taman Tugu. But I said to them, mm. if but if you want an, a real alternative. So I say this nine this nine gazebo is on that side, meaning that on team A, team gazebo on team b is only me so if you want a real alternative of not building anything or not building a gazebo is this so i just you know talk through in 3 minutes but i didn't even uh, actually explain what the design look like it is a shape uh, what what is shape what is function i didn't go through that i'm just saying that if you want to have a real alternative because this nine thing is kind of more or less the same I mean, not the same. They are gazebos, lah. What, what I'm trying to deliver, yeah. So that that's how I try to do it. You you try to make sure that you really, uh, you know, focus on the things you are different. I mean, of course, all 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 entry shelter you from weather. All entry, ha- uh, you know, you can sit inside the gazebo. So all that you, you when you look at your work and look at the people, so you try to cut off all those obvious things and just talk about things that is you know. Pertinently or obviously different. Just focus on the difference. Mm-hmm. I would say, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like something. I mean, we need to sort of like find the selling point and sell it to the juries, right? Right. Even even though the selling point, as I mentioned just now, it's not even architectural. Mm-hmm. 
the gazebo is not architecturally better. I'm just saying that alternative approach. This is team A, this is team B. I'm not saying I, I've designed special roof, I designed special floor. It's not right. architect even yeah, it's not even architecturally physically there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. that's that's the thing I would say. Oh, okay. Uh, what, what, what a productive Q&A session. I wish we had more time to drain uh, more tips and tricks from you, but I think unfortunately our time is up. And on behalf of So MIC team, um, I would like to thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. I hope we will be able to You're see welcome. you soon and invite you on our platform again. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Take care. Okay, what a productive morning learning so much about the other side of the coin of an architecture competition. I assume that all of you have taken great notes to pursue in your next competition. So make sure you credit AR, Kawa Rizmi, nor Hisham if he has inspired you. Okay, uh, next. I like to heart sell a little bit. Yes, heart sell, you've heard it right. I'm not ashamed about it, but um, our So MIC merchandise that are aesthetically designed for you. We have a range of products that you can use in your daily life from customizable t-shirts, one of which I am wearing right now. If you can see, it is the So MIC underscore question mark t-shirt in black. Um, I have I had one shirt personalized as So Am I Creative, but I've forgotten to bring it. So, But other than that, So Am I Creative, we have other vast choices of words that you can choose from, like so am I classy, so am I contextual, or even so am I cute. I also have with me another t-shirt in white showcasing our logo, which I will show in a while later, which honestly looks very casual in any outfit. Besides wearable t-shirts, uh, we also have terrazzo earrings on the shelf. These light polymer clay earrings have a range of seven designs, all for different occasions of your choice. We have some earrings, which I am wearing right now. Um, this, this design is called Enigma, and you can find it on our website. Um, it's, uh, it, it, has, it has a very nice design. It's a bit organic, but yet uh, geometric at the same time. So please do head on. There is three different types. You have this design, if you guys can see. Um, hold on, let me just show you this one. And then we have another one, which is this design. Okay, all same design, but different textures, different colors. So you have a range to choose from, okay? Um, more to that. So I have our shirt now right here with me. So this is the t-shirt that we have. Okay, second t-shirt that is in white showing our logo. It's very comfortable. We have different sizes that fit everyone. So make sure that you go onto our website to check all of these amazing merchandises out. Okay, more to that, we also have customizable tote bags sketchbooks and stickers for sale, as you can see from our slide. Um, even better, we have all of these items um, in a combo set where you can purchase them for much snatching price. So stay tuned to know what are the snatching price because it may be down to 80%, 50%, 30%, I'm not sure. So make sure you stay tuned to that. Um, you just need to head onto our website, taylorsartgrad.com to shop all of these before it's gone. All our links are down below in the description box, so make sure you head on it fast, okay? All right, okay, next on our agenda, I'm very excited because we have Lim Eugene as our speaker. He has been working in the context of art, design, and architecture, dabbling in the research, attempting to define the relationship between narrative art and architecture while his works have been published locally and featured abroad by several international publications, such as Princeton Architectural Press, Chicago-based Mass Contact, and other based in the UK. Today, Mr. Lim Eugene will be touching on an interesting yet peculiar topic, comics, corrector, and CAD. You might question what is their relationship or what are these 
constant encounters of unusual similarities and differences between them. Well, you are very lucky today as Mr. Lim Eugene is here to answer all of those questions. So without further ado, let us invite Mr. Eugene up on the platform. Hi, Eugene. Hi. Hi. Yes, can you hear me? Hold on. Uh. Oh, okay, I see what you guys are doing. Hi, Eugene. Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. <laughs> Glad to have you here. How are you feeling today? Good. Good, excited for the talk that you're going to give? Yeah, yeah, I hope everyone will like it. I'll try my best. <laughs> I will yeah. definitely like it. I think, all right, thank you for being with us today without taking too much of your time. Um, please, the platform is all yours to share. Uh, but could you share with us your uh, slides yes. on share uh, screen? Give me one minute, I'll just. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Is it clear? Okay, yes, it's very clear. Thank yes. you. The platform is all okay, yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think, first of all, I have to congratulate uh, the students that uh, in times like this, you still have to do this uh, on this online platform and you do it so smoothly. So I think it really takes an extra, quite an extra bit to make it work. So congratulations. And this this uh, talk has been off and on, I think, for a couple of months with Shan and I think I was corresponding with Shan and, and finally we, we made we make it. Uh, they I think I was approached and then I was asked uh, which three C I think concept was uh, recommended, but then I thought it was quite hard to pick one because I thought it's uh, kind of re you know all works are related um, in all of those C's, so I thought can the talk be about comics for characters and cat because uh you i hope after this talk you'll find uh, between all these three things more similarity than you thought okay um the medium of comic i think we are all very familiar with it uh, especially for me when i was younger it was uh, readily available everywhere it was a very personal kind of medium small uh, read it whenever you want and the fact that there's not much words in it so it's only through sequence of drawings that you have to show very complicated actions now, now that i look back at it i i of course i now try to study and see why did i like it so much when i was younger so that was an earlier influence and you know the medium of comic is nothing not not a stranger in the field of architecture for example if you look at these two there's uh archi graham was made the zoom issue uh as seen on the screen it was distributed it was a form that they they used they borrowed the medium of comic in order to tell people what they think and it was a medium that was easily distributed and i i think in some sense it's more approachable to people who are not trained as an architect to read drawings or understand uh, architecture and of course pamphlet architecture by Stephen Hall and I believe if I'm not mistaken it was after his graduation there weren't much work so he started uh, making these booklets so distribution about his ideas and I believe it's his, uh, his uh, studies and catalogs uh, when we talk about architecture and comics first of all I think a few years back it's already 2009 this book yes 2009 so first thing that we it comes to mind this likely is going to be this book which is yes and more by Pink. it's a me it's, it's a good book however what i'm interested in at that time when i was doing the research is not so much that kind of comic and architecture but it's more like this uh it's a it's a work by him and it's like a book citizens of no place no place get it if you have not it's amazing um it's if you look here previously what, what you have here is for me, it's a kind of stylistic thing. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's more like a template and using comic as a form of style, styling thing to explain about building. Whereas here, 
he has uh, really used the device of comics, for example, uh, gutters and, and frames, what, what happens between each frames, uh, sections and elevations unfolded, techniques like this, like, like this in, in the storytelling. And, you know, autographical drawings, I think it's a bit unorthodox, for example, here, you know, by last little, when, when the architecture is complex, how, how do you show is are the conventional uh, autographical drawings enough to, to, to show the best of uh, the piece of architecture. For example, here, you, if you look at some elevation, it's a bit slanted. And I assume for him is that conventional drawings is not enough for him to showcase the drawing. So there's a bit of folding and unfolding technique used here, which I, I like, I was excited about at that time. And on the right is something similar to James Sterling's very popular drawing, the, the worm's eye view. You know, like usually it's bird's eye view, but there's this worm's eye view, which is if you train con, uh, conventional way, you, you won't use views like this, but maybe it shows the building better. And these are some works by uh, Francois Fouten. He's a really amazing artist. For me, sometimes I think that he maybe pay more attention to the proportion and the details of buildings, more, more than a lot of architects, I think. Um, Rashka Skruten is thought to be the architect of the comic world. This is Building Stories by Chris Ware in 2012. The first look at all these drawings, you thought you came from an architect, you know, uh, but it is from Chris Ware. And the, I believe this is a book, it's, it's about uh, all the stories happening around this typology of a house in Chicago. And you see on top, you know, it shows different time, different season, different weather, different stories. At the bottom is, I guess, equivalent to uh, exploded exo um, walls removed. So these techniques are used there. Gasoline Alley by Frank King, 1934. Um, I think there was also a movement uh, in comics where the traditional comics has frame to frame to frame to frame to tell a story typically. So at that time, there were there was a, a movement uh, to, to, can we break out of this box, a conventional way of doing comics. So some of these techniques, I think, are quite amazing. For example, here you see a construction of a house, uh, one view uh, broken into 12 separate frames that gives you 12 separate time zone for that particular view. So I think it's very creative. Um, these are some works where you see the collaboration between comic artists and architect. And, you know, this is a, on the left is Yos Swate. I think I pronounced it correctly, Yos. And on the right is Mekanu. So um, they collaborated. And of course, the, the view that you see, it may not be exactly what you get at the end, but I believe through the process working with the comic artists there, I believe they, they work closely with client and they see a lot more possibilities uh, by exploring. There's, there's a lot more uh, images on the left, a part of the series, so you can check it out online. And of course, Lat locally, Kampung Boy and Tom Boy. I love these two pictures because I think he picks up uh, the, the informal behavior of people, the local people in the type of building. Uh, Kampung House on the left, and our typical uh, terrace house on the right. So this, in, uh, in, not on top of that, scale of people, he exaggerated, you know, like the, the people, is, the kids are not supposed to be that small, but they were hiding. So there was a sense of maybe even thinking about when you were younger, you felt that the space around you were much bigger, things like that, that the uh, architect, oh, sorry, the, the light, light as a comic artist has picked up, which I think a lot of architects may have, uh, you know, left out because I think, you know, after all, it's for the user architecture. It's not for a magazine or for books. Uh, so I owe a lot to these two books. If you are interested in this subject, you can def you definitely have to go through these two books because these are the two books that really got me started and I owe a lot of reference to them on some of these earlier analysis that I've presented to you. Now I will go through uh, some of the drawings that I've made chronologically. Uh, fairy tales drawings, uh, I pretty much started drawing this way since uh, because of the master's thesis in school. 
It was a thesis based in Copenhagen, as we all know, a uh, birthplace of Hans Christian Andersen, Little Mermaid is his creation. And that town sort of gives out the, the feeling of, um, uh, it's, it's very, there's a lot of storytelling kind of uh, culture in, in that place. So as part of the thesis, I had an elective subject, it's to, to, to join, it, it was an art school, so you can uh, join the, you have to choose an elective, can be anything within art school. So I joined a comic kind of, not comic club, but a comic uh, group uh, elective studio. So I thought, why not? Uh, because of the nature of the project, the storytelling nature, typically, if you were to present your project in a school on the far left, top right, top left, you will definitely have, have numbers, diagram, charts to show your understanding of site analysis. So I thought because of the nature of this project, why not uh, make a comic and, and explain about the site analysis? And also, you know, to be honest, at that time I was thinking if I can do elective, do and then submit the work, but then for the thesis it works, you know, kill two birds with one stone. That was my thinking at that time. So I did this. Uh, it's based exactly in Copenhagen. So I, 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 sorry, I don't have time to go through. Typically, I will go through and explain. I can only summarize every project. Um, so this is experience about the boy going through the city and try to explain the, the site, what, what you feel, which, which route is important, what you feel in each particular route. And if there are moments like this here that I felt that, you know, architecture and comic, they kind of frame, there's a crossover, quite an interesting crossover between them. And uh, then I, I started, uh, then the school said that you have 15 weeks to do whatever research you want after the thesis. So I thought it, it's such a waste if I just let it uh, die off what I felt earlier about the crossover between both. Therefore, I, I uh, then decided to do a series of drawing on this particular building in London, Sir Johnson's Museum. Uh, it, it's a very complex building. The reason why I picked it is as a subject of study is also because it's a building where the skin is a house and a museum. So definitely storytelling is, is, has to be a part of it. And uh, because of all the objects that he's meticulously collected and placed, you know, everywhere takes his time and place. So I, I, I always wonder, oh, I started this project with a hypothesis of it, are the conventional orthographical drawings enough to tell the story of buildings? So I, I start with the hypothesis with this research and I purposely pick this building because it's so complex. It's conventional drawings. Would you draw all the objects on the wall on your elevation? Would you, would you slice through a section and you have all these bits of section of each uh, object shown? And if you do show, do show it, is that enough to tell the story of the building? So the first thing I did was to go to visit the museum and they give you a headset, you know, go to what, number one, number two, number three, in room sequence. So I then went back to the drawing board and I thought the sequence was pretty much based on the factor of security, convenience, construction. I, I think that time they were renovating the new part of the museum. So I thought it's not the best sequence to experience build a building. So I went on and researched a bit more about a day in the life of Johnson himself. You know, who, who else will be better from the perspective if you want to pick to explain, uh, to story tell the building. So I did this, but um, the sequence is there, but the story again is the frame to frame to frame kind of conventional. So I wasn't too happy uh, after discussion and that's this, these are the final drawings. It's a, it's not frame to frame. Each page I try to portray a certain room or a certain feature of a room in the space. And there's a play of techniques that I showed you earlier. For example, here there's a bit of a dollhouse effect. Rainy London, I think I think weathers are, are extremely important in showcasing uh, architecture. I mean, we, we tend to take out the weather from buildings uh, these days. Um, sections and plan that is unfolded, uh, put side by side to let you show the proportion. Uh, okay, for example, I, I can't go through each page, but I'll show you, for example, this one. There is a very uh, cinematic kind of experience here. So they have those walls where they put all the drawings in layers. So you open up, there's another layer of artwork, and then you open up and it reveals a statue on the very far end on the other side of the building. 
So again, plan, uh, how do you, how, is that enough to show, even though, you know, traditionally we were trained to have windows or things moving on plan, then you put dotted line. But then I try to have both of them in this page, for example. I, think, I hope that it makes justice for that cinematic experience there. And it's a, it's a more melancholic kind of story attached to these drawings com compared to the fairy tales one that I showed earlier. Uh, unfortunately, it, was, it wasn't published, but it was uh, exhibited in 2015 and printed as a, as a post, postcard thing uh, alongside with uh, people like Peter Cook, uh, Zaha Hadid, Paul Smith, I think, and, and, and many more. So at that time, leaving school and then you have a thing that you do kind of for fun and submit and then it turns out to be like that, like this. There's a bit of outcome, so it gave me a, gave me a bit of a push to, to investigate further this subject. And of course, recently it's being published, just 2019. You, it's, it's all on the website. You can download the whole magazine. It's a, it's a magazine with a very good context. Sorry, content on characters. And then when I came back, uh, I just thought that it, it would be a waste if I just throw this formula away again. So I was looking around and, and I'm trying to think, you know, in Malaysia, any good buildings that has a lot of stories. So immediately I thought about this uh, building, the Blue Mansion in Chong Fatsi. And at that time, like I think like most people, I, I know the building from this kind of postcard perspective. Uh, I know it uh, for the blue, uh, I know it for this kind of, uh, you know, UNESCO, and, but it, I know nothing about all the stories in the building. So I, I went in for a visit and I realized that there's a lot of feng shui related stories, uh, whether or not you believe in feng shui, but I thought the, the, the stories were interesting and very intricate and a lot to tell. Until you visit the building, you wouldn't know that there's all these little details. So, um, so I, I like this picture, I want to show it because this is the, the only thing I sent to Lawrence Law, who's the, uh, uh, also the people, uh, the architect that I collaborated with for this book project. And that's all I gave him. And at first he didn't know what was I doing, but it was nice of him to say that, you know, I, I kind of see something, but go on and work on it further and see what you can give. And that's all I sent to him, you know. So now I look back, so I thought, uh, you know, so it's very lucky for him to uh, kind of push forward. So it's being published as a book. Compared to Sons, this is more of a romantic kind of story attached to the, the building. Um, some similar techniques here and there. Uh, okay, we can talk about this particular one. So in this one uh, image, there's the facade of the building broken down into five proportion. And you have Chong Fazi and his wife coming to the center door. And it's also reflected if you unfold it down on the plan that shows the texture of the tile. So what I was trying to do there is the unfold and folding technique while the story continues. And how do I put it all and compose in one page that represent that, that thing, that moment. And also to enhance it, you have the lovebirds coming to the center of the you know, uh, building. So this kind of thing. Unfolding the uh, internal courtyard here drawings and drawings that celebrates the rain, the little detail that captures every bit of the water. You know, that's the belief in Feng Shui. Uh, reflected in the nature, having then Chong Fazi and the family having tea next to courtyard. And this one is similar, uh, similar to Gasoline Alley. So I took, when I went around the building, I saw this very repetitive ornament. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have this as a frame around one perspective. So this is after the rain. So you can see Chong Fazi and his wife walking up the stairs. And then you see the bird coming down. So by putting this frame, I get to break one perspective into multi uh, different time. And this is one of my favorite drawing. It's about the leaf falling down, this action, right? And then the cat's trying to catch the leaf, but it falls off to the air well. And the amas pulling up the bamboo screen opening up the window, this is equivalent to the, you know, one to two scale, one to five scale of our window details at that time. So a leaf, a leaf falling down this way can judge, uh, can capture different, different moments on the elevation. So I also wanted this page to look like this uh, kind of very repetitive uh, facade elevation on the building. 
because there's more drawings. And after reading the book, you would all these uh, intense two-dimensional drawings, you would have uh, a kind of cutout. I, I tend to like this. I mean, cutout is actually very similar to the models that we make uh, you know, in architecture. But the, you know, you prepare it this way, so everyone, whether you're trained as an architect or not, you have the chance to make your own model of the going through the 2D drawings, and then now you make a 3D drawings of those lines. That was the intention. It's being published as a book. Uh, so these are test models. So you, I find the process of, although it's a book and drawing, but the process is extremely similar. And also to touch on the subject of CAD. So behind all these drawings, there's also a lot of CAD. I use a lot of CAD. I use Photoshop to, to kind of set up the base for me to work easily, uh, manually drafting you know, on, on hand. Uh, then the next project is Raza mentioned. It's a uh, building that's already gone. So I was lucky enough to know that my cousin in laws grew up there. So when I visited the place quit uh, before it's being demolished, uh, that she she gave she told me a lot of stories about their childhood stories there. So it's it's not the today kind of apartment. There's a lot of things that uh. Uh, you know, child would play. It's very, there's a lot of informal behavior there, if you can see from all these details that are picked up. Uh, so I was approached by a, a, a gallery. They say you can submit whatever artwork you want, and then they'll, you know, exhibit it. So I thought of doing this for that, but then I kind of missed the deadline, but I continue anyway and produce this drawing. So this is a one-page thing uh, that kind of uh, resemble the facade, the monotonous facade, which is, I think, main feature of the building. Uh, it's sort of peel off slowly and reveal the, these van blocks. So it's about kids playing, throwing slippers, running on corridor. No, ju not just running, but cycling in the corridor, because that's what I saw there. The bicycles, they're all parked there. So all this uh, informal behavior, which I think has a lot of things to tell about the building, which is usually, I think, we shy away. So this is, this, this is a drawing I produced to hope to portray that side of the building. And then next project is Kurau Lunch. Uh, I used to work in Bangsa. Jalan Kurau is one area which is very popular. I go there for lunch most of the time. And this is Jalan Kurau. Uh, there's a row of really low, small scale uh, shop houses. And there's one particular shop which I really like. I think uh, Auntie Mary's, we, we call that place. And I always go there for lunch. Most of the time, 60, 70 time, uh, percent of the time. Of course, it's because of the cost and because there's a casualness to the place. Uh, other areas, it's more, uh, you know, on the upper side, a bit more high end. So my colleague always asked me, why, why do you always come here? I can't really answer her at that time. Then I try to think, maybe I can answer her with a drawing. So uh, I went to the drawing board, like the previous process, and tried to make one, one drawing explains everything. This is the outcome. So that's me in the center having lunch again bro broken down into different moments and to celebrate that you know the fact that the place there's no air con is is a uh, fan it's vent naturally ventilated and of course you will sweat you know the tropical food that you eat and then i kind of want to tell people that it's okay to sweat you know then there's the uncle who's cutting the shallots also also sweating and maybe tearing up from the shallots that he's cutting so I, I, I did not want any kind of linear format of storytelling here. And that's Auntie Mary's giving uh, rice, serving the, the kids after school. So these moments, uh, I want people to kind of move their eyes around the frame and try to connect. And then all this uh, choreograph around the table of food, things like this. So I gave this drawing to her at the end. Uh, uh, she says she's going to put it up, but I'm not sure if it's there. But I think maybe she might not. She, she may not really like it because it's all black and white, maybe. Uh, then the latest project that just, just, just completed down here to the rivers. It's a, uh, the, it's one of the more intense kind of bookmaking project that I've encountered so far. It's uh, Gombat River and Klang River. Masjid Jami is here. The project is for a building called the Godown KL, located here. So this is... Bukit Nanas, you know, uh, Bukit Nanas here, KL Tower is here. There's a school here. So uh, secondary, I, I study in St. John's Institution, which is up the hill. So this is uh, 
the pathway that I take after school with all the other students down the hill through the site. Of course, that time the site is empty. It's just a car park and there's an old beautiful structure right next to it, abandoned, of course. So we just walk past it and then go, some go home, some take bus, some take LRT. But this is the day, this is the pathway every day down the hill that we take every day going back home. So um, this is a picture of me, 2001. I found, uh, after I made the book, I found this picture, which is the experience of me as a student going down with all the other students down the hill. That's St. John's Institution on the right. And um, so then I went for, as usual, you know, to do architecture training. And then when I get to know Ling Hao, architects, who's an architect, who an, did an amazing job on this building, uh, come to know him and he said, would you like to help out in this project? Then, of course, I'm excited because I told him this is the pathway, you know, down here, and then we'll take these stairs through here, and students, you know, staff, everyone take this route. It's a kind of very informal kind of pathway, which I think is a very uh, exciting and, and very amazing quality of uh, uh, character in the city, you know. So I said, of course, and uh, one of the exercises is to create a model. So. I think drawing, when we speak about drawing and this whole idea of making, whether it's also even to the medium and the form of books, the making, I think model cannot be missed out. It's so important to make models, I, I believe. So these are the uh, 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 kind of shots that we took to study what I, I did for him, to study uh, what are the possibility kind of activities, what are the feeling of the, the things that you can do in this building. Uh, what, what are the best kind of uh, character that we can we can see from using this model? So you know, it's it's paper cut out. It's two dimensional. It's it's a it's a bit uncanny the similarities between drawing manually and making models. You know, making things, making books. So these are some shots that we took outdoor, and you you can't really lie about the lighting or the feeling of the space in the when when you have a model like this. I think it's really good that you can see everything inside, you know. Uh, so this is the older part of the go down, and that's the new extension. Uh, you can visit, uh, and, and that's that's what it is today. Oh, sorry, this was taken last year. Um, so that's the path down the hill here through the building. Um, so, and then when we completed, when he completed the building, so he thought the client was quite nice and said, why don't we create a book for a drawing and a book for this building. So I thought, oh, of course, uh, that'll be exciting. So in this project, I tried something different from the other uh, projects that I've mentioned earlier. It's a very simple approach, um, kind of slice of life kind of sequence to the to the, to the the storytelling. No fancy uh, folding and folding. I, I try to do it this way, you know. I was inspired by uh, comic artists like Jiro, Taniguchi, that kind of just a man walking in the streets of Tokyo, for example, picking up all these informal details. And we didn't want um, the building to be the main character, but the story of uh, the story of the two kids coming down the hill through the building, you know, very curious, explore the building and then explore the city. We want the flora and fauna, uh, the weather, the wind, the rain to be also the main character of this book. So uh, it was very difficult to, to translate the book into an actual print because offset is the only is the way to go, printing in large scale. So meticulously, we uh, went and checked, quality check, and make sure it was transferred onto the metal screen that you see on the left that, so that they can run the offset. And I particularly like this page because that's the paper that they put on the top pile of the paper so that they clean the ink in the offset machine. So you can see layers, layers, layers of the artwork in on this page. Um, so I think it's a, at, at the end, this is a three over meter long book. It's very long and we decided to keep the whole book as one material. It's an uncoated paper. It's, it's, I, I, I believe it's most uh, uh, honest for, for, for to present the book. Of course, we could have went for hardcover, coated cover, uh, a more shiny and more substantial kind of thick book that you hold in hand. But I think because of the character of, and how we approach this and the whole you know approach of architecture, 
uh, uh, in this project. I think it's most honest to do it this way. Um, so every book is slightly different because we, we struggle. It's, although there's mechanics to help to fold, uh, sorry, fold by hand, every single book and check by hand and kind of adjust to make it straight, things like that. But at the end, we were very happy with it. I think the print went really well. It, it looks, we wanted the, the book, although offset, to look like an actual pencil. So you look at it, you thought it's pencil drawings. You wouldn't thought that it's being printed or whatever. I believe we've achieved that. Uh, recently, it's being exhibited in Singapore, Archifest. Um, there's some slides, some picture of the book. Uh, I can't show all the pictures, of course. Uh, but let me know if you are interested to get a copy of this book because we don't put it in bookshops, but we only will send it to you. If you're interested, you, you contact me and I'll, I'll try to deliver it to you. So it's a, sorry, it's about a story about uh, a boy and a girl. After school, come down the hill, simple, pass through different uh, eras of building around there. You, there's some really brutal building, really nice brutal building. St. John's Institution, which is very old, 1904, 06. Down the hill, through the building, you know, and then they discover all sorts of elements around the building and then back into the city. And of course, I think the title we mentioned about cat, I, I want to emphasize here is that I think a lot of the time we always have this spectrum that architect likes to debate about whether you're on the far end on the technology, cat, uh, you know, software, you know, he is your life and it's good, it's good to you. I don't deny that it's amazing. And so the, the other end, which is hand drawing. But for me, I think the best is you, you make the full use out of both, which I believe so far, all these drawings, I've, I've used both. Although at the end product, it's, it's like a, a handmade thing, handmade thing, hand drawn, but it's actually thanks to also software and whatever. But the last project down the hill, I did not use any tracing or anything. We decided to meticulously of course photos but we would draw redraw the the whole project based on your eye looking at the building uh, looking at the photos and then you just proportionally redraw the whole thing and also i've used a 0.3 hp pencil because it's easier for me to still decide as i go as i draw i can i can still decide what i want to do i can still erase if i use something too hard or a pen you know compared to the previous projects, I, I can't change. That, that, that one is, you have a very fixed idea and then you go, this one you draw as you go and then you erase, slightly you adjust. So it's a very different approach to the building. And lastly, some publication, uh, very lucky enough about that some drawings are featured in this book by Princeton. Uh, now the original drawings, I believe it's in New York, somewhere in US. The exhibition is over. Uh, you can get this book, of course, I believe you can order from Kinokuniya or Book Depository, I think. So, um, but the ongoing exhibition, I think, because of the whole situation, is, is supposed to travel all around US, but I think now they're still discussing what to do. But I'm very happy to be a part of this, uh, you know, just enjoying myself doing drawing. And someone would actually say, hey, wh why don't you send the original, original drawing to us, then we can let other people see so far away and other than exhibition uh, you know it's being published in some uh, literature sorry not literature like a research on architecture exhibited in the UK and and uh, there's this guy uh, who's I think based in Spain but he's an expert in this subject between comic and architecture so I'm so very happy to have uh, uh, the drawings to be a part of his research that he actually travels around in US making tour and to explain about the 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 this combination this niche and thank you uh, very much please ask questions okay hi Eugene hello Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I really like your drawings. They all very look very intricate and complex. I bet it took very long, right, to do all of them? Um, for the previous projects, they individually, each page is about, you know, if you want to count man hour, you say two to three days full time, but two, I think- Full time, so we're talking about 12 hours straight? 
uh, yeah, you, you can, it depends. Uh, actually, drawing is really fast, but the pitching, the idea and to lock the idea is the longest process. Or also wow. making of the book is extremely long. You can right, draw, but right, to right. print, print, offset is really another... Another whole one. <laughs> I yeah. see. Okay. Well, um, anyways, thank you so much for your session. Uh, we really, truly really enjoyed looking at all the amazing comics and the drawings that you have. Uh, now we have some questions coming up. So the first question is, how do you generate ideas or inspiration? Uh, generate ideas or inspiration. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a kind of everyday kind of thing. Like there's a lot of project that I kind of, you know, a lot of these things are, are not. People will write to you, "Hey, would you like to, would you like to draw, you know, commission you and draw something for our building?" Very, mm-hmm. I mean, for me lah, this is very less likely projects come this way, but more of you, you know, take face, go and pitch to people and say, "Would you like the drawing for your building?" It's like it's more likely that way. So, uh, just I I just look around, uh, see whatever is interesting, or I kind of pick up take a note down and see if maybe potentially can propose this or propose that something like mm-hmm. that. yeah and I see you have a lot of books behind you so is that also how you generate one of all your inspiration uh, of course yeah. of course uh, <laughs> but there's more there's right. more I think there's more graphic and comics book compared to architecture sometimes True, I think right. if you if you look at architecture too much also you Will tend to. I mean, you have a look at all the poss- possible, uh, you know, beautiful works by comic artists. Sometimes it reminds mm-hmm. you of architecture way more. I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question is: Do you have any advice for young graduates who likes to pursue in doing comics? Uh, I. It's I. I think although I presented it this way, but I think the two profession, of course, is very very different. Right. It's very different. It's a, it's a, if you choose that way, I think you pursue that way. You choose that way, to pursue that way. But of course, there's what I'm trying to show you is there's a lot of similarities. That means we don't look at, we, you know, I think uh, someone, a filmmaker, kind of in the 60s, I believe, kind of listed down the first art, second art, third art, and, and comics is the ninth art. Architecture is the first oh. art, you know. Okay. So I don't know if, if it's a kind of hierarchy or not, but we tend to look at architecture with a, like a highbrow kind of thing. And it's very formal, whereas comics is mm-hmm. informal, and, you know, a bit more casual. But I guess what, what I want to show here is that they are, they don't, they are, you should loop it all around. Your references, your drawings, your process should be a loop. It's not just architecture. You know? Look at other form of arts. And comics, I, I, I cannot say that I'm a comic artist because I still struggle to draw. Comic artists, you know, when they get a script or they write a script, it's a whole book, like two, three hundred pages script, and then they will draw so fast because they are very, really, really professional at it. So this is, I, I believe, it's not even close to anything comic artist. So I cannot comment on that. Although the appearance look like a kind of comic artist thing. But I mean, from from your slides, amazing slides. I think we all think that you're already a comic artist. You're very close to there already. Okay. Um. Next question is, um, how do you challenge yourself to do the opposite of ordinary, which I think you are already doing? So, what are the public's responses? Oh, public response. Right. Uh, think things that I tend to get is people kind of first, which is nothing wrong, the first impression is always, oh, there's a lot of lines. It's very intense. There's there's so much detail. Uh, of course, there's nothing wrong, but you know, I hope it doesn't stop there. Mm-hmm. I hope that they go through the drawings, the story, and try to understand what the drawing is trying to say, rather than a kind of, um, you know, if you talk about drawings, which is very detailed and intense, if you go online, there's, of course, so many artists who can do that already. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm say, mm-hmm. that is the kind of response typically I would get. So a drawing speaks a thousand words, lah, right? Yes, and <laughs> of course, more more than just the experience, lah. Hopefully, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. understood. Okay, next question is: How can this mode of comic storytelling be translated or adapted for people who don't have good sketching skills, like me, oh. in the <laughs> 
That's why I, I say, you know, try not to look at it as an appearance. Uh, of course, it's a beautiful beauty thing is, you know, of course, it's, it's, uh, in, in, in a, you can't deny that that's important. But for example, uh, there's a few artists like Saul Steinberg. Uh, if you look up Saul, S-A-U-L, Steinberg, S-T-E-I-N-B-E-R-G. I believe he's trained as an architect, but if you look at his drawings, he's, he's done very simple, amazing drawings. And mm -hmm. it's not whether you can sketch or not. It's not so much whether you sketch and that drawing look like, you know, beautiful or not. It's beautiful or not. If you look at Saul Steinberg drawing, you know it's, it's beautiful. And it's not mm -hmm. the typical Francis D.K. Ching kind of intensity, you know. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um... Next question. So the last question would be um, one of the audience say, thanks for sharing, Eugene. Um, any particular reason why your works are mostly in black and white? Uh, to be honest, I started it off that way. And to me, to be also extra honest, I, I'm really bad at coloring. Uh, but of course, there's, I think black and white is quite, you know, for example, the Blue Mansion project I mentioned, a lot of people know the building by its blue and almost nothing else not, not almost nothing else but you know it's the blue is overwhelming is this is it's in the name it's, it's everything about it most mm -hmm. most things about it. but maybe the drawing can be a black and white thing so that you, you go away from the color and, and try to look at lines that reminds you of proportion uh, scale uh, depth uh, uh, layers things like that this kind of element rather than looking at it as a color Colorful thing, but of course, right. uh, I, I I don't know. Maybe in the future we'll try color. Yeah, no idea. Right, right. Um, so there is a connecting question. It says, um, I'm also curious how would it be in different colors. So have you ever had any thoughts on having it in different colors, and how would you think that it would be? Uh, different colors. I think if you look at the the metal sheet, actually, it's quite nice on the left. Because this is it's not a color that you choose because it looks good or looks nice, because mm -hmm. that color looks good, you know. It's it's there because traditionally it's being done this way and it's in blue. So that okay. I, I if I'm not wrong, there's a kind of light thing that it detects so it transfers onto the offset rolling right. paper. So, you know, the selection of blue is truthful there, then I believe it's a beautiful color. But to mm. color it, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you can buy the book and color it if you want. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that is it for the q and I thank you so much for being with us today. We are very enlightened by your session. So we just want to wish you good luck on your future and diverse. And maybe next time we'll be able to invite you on these kind of architectural platform again. Sure. Ken? Okay. Much. Is there anything else you'd like to add on to your viewers or friends? Uh, no, that's it. That's it. Yeah, okay. Let me, let me know. So yeah. Let me know if you've got any questions. Okay, okay, sure. All right, thank you so much and see you see you again, Eugene. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Um all right, so what an interesting comics, uh, I mean, comics, CAD, and architecture, all in one topic, right, and all in one session. I hope you guys enjoyed um, his eye-pleasing comic um, and drawings on the slides, and learn a thing or two if you want to join comics, uh, in the comics field or anything like that. But um, there are some interesting things that I would like to introduce to you. Um, these are our vendors who were supposed to be with us, but due to the pandemic, wasn't um, being able to come. So they are Velvet Vanity Cosmetics, baked by yours truly, Baba Bros, and Don't Yell at Me Malaysia. So Velvet Vanity offers a reasonable price lip, uh, lip products from lipstick to glosses. So do hit them up a follow at Shop Velvet Vanity. Next, it will be heavily again to have Big Fight Yours Truly with us, but sadly we can't due to social distancing, but you can always hit them up on their 
IG store for some scrumptious goods to be delivered to your home. So also our loyal vendor, Baba Bros. Now Baba Bros is a food truck that goes around many places serving delicious Italian food. So make sure you hit them up and follow them to see where are their latest hideout places. And being as generous as they already are, they are giving away to everyone who is watching us right now. Yes, I mean, everyone now, uh, a two ringgit voucher off on a single purchase and it's valid till 31st of August. So how great is that? All you gotta do is simply take a screenshot of this slide and flash it to them when you are there. So I'm just gonna leave it here for about five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, last but not least, Don't Yell At Me has recently joined us as one of our sponsor and vendor. The flavors offered in Don't Yell At Me includes honey oolong tea, rose milk tea, original chocolate milk, and many, many more. If you have the chance to visit them, I'm sure you'll be pleased by the interiors. All architecture students will be that it features eye-pleasing white claw dangling from the ceiling and th thin tree trunks in some corners. So you will be glad to know that there are also mirrors there to help you create the most Instagrammable worthy shots. So for all of you bubble tea fan or architectural um, geeks, please do hit, um, hit onto their website and their Instagram to check them out. Please hit them up and show your love and support. All the links are linked down below in our description box. So, all right, so who is excited now for the next session? Because the next session we are having is an alumni sharing session. It's an informal session, so you guys can always uh, chat with us on the YouTube chat and um, sort of interact with the alumni. They will be seeing the chat as well as our team will be. So if you have any questions, please do hit onto the YouTube chat and communicate with us. So if you want to know anything about their works or their lifestyle, if they have, um, <clears throat> if they have any partners, do hit the, <laughs> do chat with them on the YouTube chat right now, okay? So now is your chance. So today's alumni are all proud future thinkers of our batch. And these A-list students are Coit featuring his semester six project, The Healing Machine, Shannon presenting works from semester five, Collage and Overlap. And finally, Ryan Sapp featuring his works from semester three, Behind the Walls and semester two, Tribute to the Fallen Ains Soldiers. So now I'd like to invite our very, very first speaker, Koi, I uh, sorry, Shannon, to join us live. Hello, Lindsay. Hi. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> How are you? Uh, well, we've been talking the past three days, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I hope you're good. I hope you had like a really nice sleep. Okay. Today we were slightly late. We woke up a bit late. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, um, so, can you have your slides up? Yeah, I have my slides up. Slides up already. Okay, are you excited to yeah. share with us your Performing Arts Center, Kajang? Sure, yeah. let's, let's see how it goes. Okay, all right. The platform is all yours then. All right, thank you. All right, hi guys. Uh, um, currently, I'm not able to see YouTube chat, but I'll be interacting with all of you later. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for So My C once again. Uh, cannot... Uh, express the amount of love I have for all of you for uh, supporting us. Well, today I'm just going to do a little bit of an informal sharing session about my semester five work uh, in the Performing Arts Center in Kajang. Uh, just give you guys a little bit of a brief uh, introduction to all of this is uh, our brief was actually to create a corner lot uh, performing arts center within Kajang itself and the emphasis of semester five, which uh, most of you would know or most of you would know, uh, is to create public, public life within the city. And so the brief was very specifically uh, told us that we have to leave 40% of our site for building and opening up the remaining 60% of the site for public use. So, uh, wait a sec. All right, shout out to uh, my friend uh, Nabil and my group mate at that time who drew this beautiful isometric uh, of this town of Kajang. If you want to check him out, uh, his handle is Kyosoi at the bottom of the screen. Um, and let, let me just talk a little bit about Kajang and uh, how, how this whole experience uh, went down. So in semester five, I was tuted with uh, Mr. Eric uh, for, uh, 
he was my tutor for semester five. And uh, when we first went to Kajang, uh, Mr. Eric was just acting as his tour guide for us, uh, even though he's not local, but he's just uh, telling us all of his experiences he had with old towns uh, in the past and uh, giving us little uh, bits of trivia along the way. And it was a really fun time. Um, but my initial reaction upon arriving in Kajang is, this is this is pretty similar to Klang, which is where I, I come from. Um, and it's definitely not a place for a performing arts center because if you look at the city itself, um, it's an old town, first of all. Second of all, the demographic definitely leans a bit older. Um, there are no tourists, nobody, uh, there's no tourists, nobody comes there. And uh, so the idea came up, who are we making this place, uh, who are we making this performing arts center for? And uh, why, why, why did this idea of um, no culture or like a, a losing culture happen in Kajang in the first place? And so um, after doing a little bit of research, uh, we actually come up with a couple of ideas. But one of the things we realized was Kajang is a city of displacement. Um, what we see in Kajang is actually they are experiencing an urban sprawl as we see more, uh, more and more uh, modernist blocks pop up within the colonial uh, buildings within the site. So the scales of the buildings are getting bigger, the urban greens getting coarser, and uh, we're starting losing, losing all of the uh, nice gems that were left behind in the past. And a lot of the lively streets were also disp uh, displaced by vehicles. So pedestrians are favored, uh, are removed in favor of vehicles, vehicular transport, um, and as well as the communities. So if you look at a brief experience through the communities, we can see that Kajang was at first inhabited by indigenous people. Um, but later, the Mandalang community came from uh, Sumatra, Indonesia, um, because of trading. And later, this community was then uh, lost out to the Chinese tin miners and, and their rubber estuaries in the 1860s. And along this same time, the Indians also came to uh, settle down in Kajang itself. And so uh, finally, uh, the Chinese began to move out of the old uh, satellite town and they've uh, begun moving into closer into the city center and um, also into high, uh, more affluent neighborhoods. So we can see um, the, this uh, different displacement of communities happen throughout the whole generations. And so we've reached our fifth phase of, fifth phase of displacement, where now local communities are beginning to become fewer and fewer in Kajang itself. And they're displaced by the migrant communities, uh, the migrant workers that have been brought in because of their cheap labor. So, uh, these migrant laborers actually live in the shop houses on top of the shop houses. And this is because it's uh, cheaper in rental for them. Um, and that's not the only thing that's been displaced. A lot of buildings have been renovated really poorly. Um, they are not really uh, kept up uh, with their colonial facade. Um, some of them are even demolished. Uh, some of them are poorly maintained. And so slowly and slowly, um, we can see Kajang becoming this town of just having satay. When you think of satay, you think of kajang. It has become synonymous at this point. And so when we're doing our little group site analysis, we're thinking, okay, what is this phenomena? How can we brand it in, a, in such a way where it's sellable? And it also makes a lot of sense in terms of a package. And we thought of the idea of the sunset town where kajang used to be at uh, some, some form of prime during the tin mining uh, days where there was a lot of affluent uh, communities living there um, because of the economic boom. But right now it's become a shell of itself at some, some level. And so uh, if you really want to, uh, and okay, just a, a little bit of a sidetrack since it's an informal session, right? Um, this site analysis, uh, the idea of Sunset Town, which is, I think this was one of my probably favorite site analysis experiences because of uh, how well I think my team worked together. And I really enjoyed myself through this semester five um, for multiple reasons. Lah. Um, and how we come up with the idea of Sunset Town was we all pitched in a keyword of what we thought uh, Kajang was. And then we began to uh, connect all the keywords together. And we sort of forced it a little bit, sort of uh, aligned our perspectives a little bit. And uh, we came up with this theme of the Sunset Town. And that's how it all uh, managed to come together. Lah. So then we also looked at the public life of the city in three different scales, the small to big. And also we looked at it from the open to enclosed typology. And uh, if we really wanna see, uh, if this semester is really about talking about public realm, this is definitely something that you have to uh, study at some level. And so uh, what we wanted to note here is our performing arts center is a medium skill. So then we began to focus in on the medium skill uh, strategies. And some of the strategies used are a very high visibility, 
a lot of shop lots use uh, signboards. And also, if they want people to come in, they animate the street or the storefronts uh, in order to bring in more people. And so, uh, so running the idea of uh, sate kajang, right? Uh, this was actually prepared for my future thinker slide in semester five. Uh, I wanted to uh, present the whole thing in such a way where I want you guys to correlate uh, different ideas of Malaysian foods uh, to the place of the place of its origin, 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 the place of its origin. So then I was, I was saying like, where did this come from? Chakwetel. Everybody's obviously gonna say Penang. Where did this come from? Sarawak Kolomi. Where did this come from? My hometown, Klang. And where is this? Sate Kajang, right? And then I began to like prove the point even further. Like this is this is where how Sate Kajang is uh, right now. Like there's so many restaurants within Kajang that sell just purely sate. So Kajang is this sate town. And uh, then I then I sort of like concluded and said that uh, maybe Kajang is having a bit of an identity crisis. I mean, if you're thinking of something to describe the city, right? What what kind of city is it? Is it a city that accommodates? Is it a city that adapts or is it a city that's dying? And what I've uh, noticed throughout is um, it's actually a city of collage. It's a city of collage because um, these different uh, communities have been displaced, these different architecture styles have been displaced. They're all cut and paste uh, of different identities. So although Kajang is a functional city, right? yet remnants of its culture still remains. So not all of it has been erased uh, from Kajang itself. And so nothing is fully blotched out and nothing is fully new either. And I think this is pretty common across old towns in Malaysia. I mean, looking at my own town itself, uh, Klang is a whole cut and paste town because it has been so old historically that new buildings have come, new communities have come and everything has changed. And so the brief, uh, going back to the brief again, it's talking about public life, right? So I really like this quote by uh, Kisho Kurokawa, where it says, Oriental cities have no squares or plazas, or Western cities possess no streets. So if you really want to look at where the public life lies in the city, you got to look to the streets. And this is the most common typology uh, you find on the streets. And it's something that uh, at this point is sort of a cliche, but it's also one of the most predominant features of the old towns across Malaysia. And that is the five foot walkway. So what I did here was I just threw together a collage of four or five different five foot walkways I saw throughout Kajang. And I threw them all together just so that you can see uh, with a brief overview of what happens on the five foot walkways. And so the five foot walkways uh, began uh, just as a form of circulation for people to walk in a shaded area. But right now people are using this as workshops, restaurants, social spaces, gathering spaces, and some people even take on a more defensive scheme, as we see through the front, where they actually board up, um, board up the five-foot walkways and uh, don't allow for pedestrian circulation to happen. So if the five-foot walkways are places where public life occurs and people are boarding it up, then where does the public life actually happen in Kajang anymore, right? And so uh, this is actually our site. Uh, it was supposed to be, or, uh, we are supposed to demolish uh, this old, uh, uh, sate shop over here, a food court, and uh, we're supposed to build our new site here. And so with that idea of streets uh, diminishing in its presence and its uh, importance, I was thinking, how about we have an intention where we take the street and we wind it up all the way, all the way to the top throughout my whole building um, and allow people and the public realm to be able to access through and through. On top of that, I'll take the idea of the five foot walkway and use it as a visual indicator to suggest circulation for the pedestrians. So not only will they be uh, walking up to the, uh, they, they won't just be walking up blindly towards the top, but this five foot walkway will sort of be guiding them towards the top. So this is our site. Uh, and we, as we can see from, uh, this is a movement pattern sort of a study. Uh, and what we did was we stalked different people on site and we saw what their demographic was and we saw how they moved around the site. And uh, hopefully when you do this on your own site analysis, uh, you don't get caught by the people because it's going to be really awkward if you do, or they might report you. Lah. Okay, so this site, right, uh, is site B, uh, highlighted in red, and it's actually an overlap between the old and the new district. Um, and right next to site B, um, if I can turn on a laser pointer, uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, so right next to site B, there's a little bit of an alley over here. Okay, um, and this alley is actually given us a new opportunity to activate it. 
And um, this alley actually con con connects these two places together. And site B is sort of that central point where the old district and the new district sort of connects together in this, uh, in this point. But right now, nobody is using the alley. And the reason being is because it's being obstructed by the food court itself. And so uh, we studied, sorry. So we studied the section through the street itself. And we can see uh, this is where our site is located. And yeah, this is where our site is located. This uh, restaurant over here. And what this, the alley is located over here. So it's actually obstructed by the Hajj Samori Satay restaurant as the kitchen faces it. And there are no active frontages over here. And we also take into account that there is a KFC just right opposite the street. And uh, over here is Jalan Sulaiman, which is the street that is fronting our building, where our building should be placed. And uh, so Jalan Sulaiman is actually the place where it that leads different arterial roads into the town itself. And so as we see all this, uh, we sort of realize that food is a very prominent program um, of the town itself. And it's also a place of social gathering. So wait a sec. So let me just give you guys a summary of issues to tackle. First of all, we need placemaking efforts. Although there are certain placemaking efforts in Kajang right now, um, they're still not enough. There is the idea of collage where all the different uh, identities of Kajang are being blurred right now. There's no, there's no distinctive uh, culture that we are celebrating. Also a sense of safety. When you have streets that are littered, when you have crowded, uh, when you have really tight alleys uh, and dark alleys, um, people are not interested uh, in walking through them because there's no sense of safety. And also a lack of public life in general. Um, we see the streets not being inhabited. Uh, we see people very seldom um, stay, out, uh, stay outdoors or in between buildings, life between buildings. Um, so that's also another thing that we have to tackle. And so this was actually one really fun thing that I used to generate my design ideas, uh, which is study models using sponges of different colors. And uh, from our, this is my very first study model where I decided to use the red sponge to indicate the street that winds into the building itself. And that was okay, but it was a little bit chaotic. So I gave it a little bit more, I gave it a little bit more structure by having it, um, uh, I labeled it in green this time. And uh, I wanted the idea of the public life to wind all the way up into the building. And then it came down into a much more concise uh, sort of a representation of all of this. Uh, with the idea of uh, animating the streets with storefronts um, as highlighted in red, having a very open plaza in the front of the building in order to connect the alley towards Jalan, uh, Jalan Tun Abdul Aziz, and um, also to open up the visibility. So we can see from the top little white sponge there, it's actually cut out so that it faces the corner lot and uh, people can see into the building. And so the building is very permeable in its uh, form. So yeah, uh, this is how my final uh, out, uh, output looked like. And um, this is the east elevation. So uh, the idea was I wanted to pedestrianize it along the front elevation that leads to this informal stage shade, shade, shaded by the trees. Uh, along the south elevation, we can see that I should really cut out this portion that so that the alley and Jalantu Abdul Aziz are able to be connected to each other, as well as um, I included a wide staircase here to double as seating for people who are passing by and also to invite people to absorb people into the building itself. Okay. So then we look at the floor plan itself, right? Um, since people like to walk in the five foot walkway because it's shaded, I think Malaysians like to do that in general. Uh, we can also see that what I did was I, I wanted to absorb people from different sites, uh, coming in from different sites uh, into my building by providing them a little bit of shade through the five foot walkway and hopefully they'll stick around for the program in the middle here, which is I introduced the old program of the satay restaurant. So I didn't discard the program, but I left it there so that people, because people already have a, a memory towards the place. Um, as well as, uh, wait a sec. Yeah, and as well as animating different, uh, the street front, the store, uh, the street by having different storefronts face, facing the street as well. Okay, so these are a little bit of before and after renderings uh, of my building itself. So if you see the five foot walkway, right, this is an, actually an indicator for the pedestrians as I mentioned earlier, and the open staircase that doubles as a seating for this informal stage to happen over here. It's actually a very public space so that people can actually see through to the alley on the other side. 
Um, also, you can see uh, the louvered facade over here is actually angled so that people can have uh, visibility into the building itself. So when whatever activity is happening in the building, people can see it from all the way from the street itself. And the louvered facade sort of fits the vernacular context because of its uh, style or uh, reminiscent of the jalousie windows around site. And they're really good for sun shading. Don't forget that. Uh, also, we wanted to have a very permeable ground floor. So you can see the ground floor is actually quite open towards the public. Um, and there's this shaded walkway to absorb people in to use the building as a preferred sense of thoroughfare. Um, the alley is actually leading from the old to new district uh, towards the building, which is like a central point. And this building celebrates uh, the functionality of program because of the satay restaurant. So when people pass by from the old to new district, perhaps they smell the satay and be invited to go inside. And hopefully in the same time, the alley is rejuvenated with uh, murals so that people will have a better sense of safety towards going to the building itself. Now, the tricky thing is definitely to control privacy yet maintain the building as a very public space. If your intention is to have a public building, right, you can have the whole building be public because there are more private programs as well. And so there's a sense of a controlled hierarchy in terms of the program itself. So the ground floors are most open, allowing for spontaneous activity to happen um, and this is due to the highest traffic flow because it connects through the alley. Um, but then it also self-reinforces. So people see people and people want to be where people are. So it self-reinforces. And so people bring programs and programs will reinforce again and bring in people again. And so um, this is your daily reminder to read your Yang Gyal book uh, about life between buildings. Okay, so then uh, we look into the first floor plan. Uh, sorry, yeah, the first floor plan where the white staircase actually leads you into this a very permeable, uh, perme permeable uh, sort of a first floor where there'll be an instrument and costume dis display and showcase uh, with a performing room and a gallery corridor. And so the idea is to place a corridor of the five foot walkways on the most outer ring uh, in order for people to constantly look down towards the informal stage. So there's sort of a dialogue established there. Um, and also, when people on the street see people walking around the perimeter of the building, they'll also be attracted because they have some sort of fostered trust in that sense. They see people in the building and they also want to be within that building. And so, uh, yeah, people will generally be curious to what the building has. Um, as you can see here, this is the instrument showcase room. We have a very configurable space by allowing doors to fully slide open and it's adaptable for events of various sizes and requirements. Uh, the idea of the five-foot walkway is re, uh, reinforced uh, because the five-foot walkway is a multifunctional thoroughfare. Not only is it used for circulation, it's also used for displaying goods, it's also used for socializing, etc., etc. So the idea came up of a uh, gallery corridor. So it's not just a circulation, but it's also a place for you to display your traditional instruments. And these arches create a very nice and intimate gallery space where people can uh, be comfortable in. Well, we're entering their second floor now, and the circulation then goes up another floor again, with the staircase being set again to the outer ring. And why is that so? It's because we want to constantly create that dialogue with the informal space, uh, informal public space in the front of the building, um, and vice versa, so that the public space can see people walking into the building itself. So enter, you can ent uh, from there you can enter the dance practice rooms as well as the performing space that crowns the building itself. And this is the new amphitheater. The louvers are oriented towards the city and the city forms the backdrop of performance. Um, and so this controlled hierarchy and privacy uh, uh, are shown through this less permeable plan on the highest floor. But this is also where culture will be celebrated in more formal dance showcases. And it also doubles as a local event hall. So let's talk about the new identity. Kajang has a culture to be celebrated amidst all of its unique layers right, of collage. It's uh, usually hidden under this process of displacement where some things get lost within the process. So the building then resurfaces all of these hidden gems by being functional for the locals, yet raising awareness on local art scenes through constant public exposure. Uh, I, that's all for my Kajang building itself, but I'll give you guys uh, three little tips before I end my, uh, my whole presentation over here. Throughout your whole semester, the first tip is to have open conversations with your tutors as well as your friends. Don't keep the design to yourself. So peer learning is definitely one of the things that helped me through and through uh, most throughout this semester. I always ask my friends to critique my work and see what's the flaws within it. The second thing is you're in semester five, so you most likely need to read the books of urban theories. 
Uh, throughout this whole uh, process, I began re reading the seven responsive environments, the urban design compendium, as well as Ian Gale's books. Uh, so I have a better understanding of the terminology use, and I can better use the terminology to describe what's happening within my building itself. Third thing is during presentations, uh, hopefully you can frame your narrative. So always start with a hook. Uh, in this case, I started with the idea of sate. And during our site analysis, we had the hook of actually buying sate uh, from one of those uh, one of those kiosks, uh, branches opened up by Sate Kajang, and we brought it to our tutors to bribe them to give us a better grade. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't work that well. They all saw through us. And uh, once you start your hook, always conclude your presentation, because you don't want just to leave your presentation hanging. So what I did here was I concluded my presentation with uh, identity crisis, and I ended it with a new identity. So hopefully you guys learned something from this sharing session, and uh, I'll now pass the time to Lindsay or Koi. Hello, hold on. Uh. <laughs> okay, hi, hi, Shannon. Hello. Okay, hi. Well, very interesting. I really love the way you presented it. Now I'm sort of craving for kajang sate. So you owe me one since you are the one who introduced it in the slides just now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, as discussed, we will have Coit and Ryan up first and we'll put you on hold. So I'll see you in a bit for the Q&A session. All right, sure. Okay, all right, see you. Okay, now let's have uh, Coit up as um, he will be sharing his semester six projects, The Healing Machine. Hi, Lindsay. Where are you? you Hi, Coit. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How are you? I'm doing great. Great. Do you sleep well yeah. last night? Uh, not really. Not really? <laughs> Busy, is it? No. Uh, you know, we're still working on the event, right? I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for those who don't know, I forgot to mention, Coit and Shannon are our co-leaders of the So MIC organizing team. So... They're like my bosses, lah, okay? <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you for sacrificing so much for your precious time to make this event happen. So this time is all yours. So please tell us more about the healing machine. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Koi. And today I'll be sharing my uh, final year project, the healing machine. Okay, so... Looking at the map of Chuho Baru, where our site is, it's actually uh, quite, it's highly populated by the commercial and institutions uh, buildings. And it shapes the town with a very dense population. The site study uh, uh, suggested that the vehicular circulation uh, or the main roads are actually cutting the city into uh, long vertical districts. And the cultural heritage is fading when the development rise drastically over the years. As you can see from this uh, diagram here, it's being cut, cut by the main roads or the vehicular circulations. And the cultural essence is actually uh, fading due to the vast development. And the site itself is actually located at uh, one of the long stretch, uh, long vertical stretch and connecting the short lots on the uh, on site as well as a, a tall office building on the right and we have some malls Komta mall the city square malls and some hotels offices buildings that's close closely pro, uh, that's at the close proximity of around 100 uh, meter radius and the site currently uh, is undergoing a construction of a hub that connects the pedestrian across the two vehicular roads Imagine, so there's these two, uh, the sites over here. So there's these two main uh, vehicular roads. And imagine this as this site currently is being developed as a giant pedestrian bridge that's linking two main street and the buildings over here. Yeah, uh, this is the, uh, due to the reason that uh, walkability along uh, the road, which is, uh, as you can see here, is viable due to the dedicated uh, pedestrian walkway along the path, along this uh, main road. But accessing 
across the streets is very limited due to the uh, limiting path that is uh, available on site to cross to uh, the two streets. And this graph is actually uh, the working process of the machine. So uh, let's have a quick look of my uh, strategy to cure the sickness. So I'm building a healing machine and there's this due to the sickness. So we need to create uh, medicine and cure to uh, overcome the sickness. So the first sickness is that uh, there's this uh, high transient, uh, it, it's actually an intangible issue. And this uh, issue is that due to the vast development of the city, there's uh, a high transient group, notably the working adults or the tourists, meaning they come and go. They stay for a very short time and they are function focused. As you can see from this um, collage, over time, uh, the building, uh, the city is being developed, but the culture is being neglected as well as the heritage. So, sorry, just some issues here. Yeah, so I've come up with a idea. So if the uh, user themselves are, don't have time to uh, work on, to, to appreciate the site and they are actually function focused. So what's the, uh, what's the very, very fast way to let them understand or to get into their minds quickly. Then I was thinking of the supermarket shelves. Uh, every time I go to the supermarket, uh, the products are very neatly arranged that you can actually pick uh, uh, to the very end of uh, from one corner, saving your time to browse through all the things. So it's very easy to understand and very fast to get to your item. So translating that into a building, building sketch, and uh, it looks like this. Uh, the users are actually browsing through the selections of programs on this uh, facade itself, so they could make their choices fast. I also look into the uh, uh, the design of a shopping shopping uh, shopping market where it is actually um, focused in attracting the attention through uh, human senses. By that, I've uh, incorporated my programs through the placement of the uh, department of the programs. Then I also look into a vending machine. So why is it vending machine? It's because it's legible. The products are, uh, and the prices are very clearly uh, listed on the, on, the, on the facade itself. And it's always available when needed and has the ability to, to be shared. Like you will uh, get a product and then you will share it to others. So the idea is there. And translating it to the sketches, I have this. Uh, so the pedestrian bridge is over here that is connecting the two uh, streets, two main streets. And the machine, vending machine is over here facing the, uh, facing the uh, current users. So after they have chosen their uh, activities, they could flow in to integrate, to connect with other uh, activities and programs. And a section that is showing uh, the, the initial idea, but actually this is not to scale and it looks very tall, which is not possible for our project size. And the vending machine itself is the, it explores the efficiency of a spatial uh, legibility within a very short time period. So this is also uh, interplay of the facade, giving it more, uh, more like uh, understanding of the programs provided through the display of uh, the programs. So looking at this diagram, you can see that uh, the connecting uh, pedestrian bridge across two streets, this is where the people are currently using to cross the streets and the building mass is actually uh, flowing, responding to it. Then I've broken down the programs into smaller integrated spaces. Then I've interplay with the height and the solid voids to allow this uh, visible uh, visual permeability across the two streets. Then I was also thinking, um, what's the better way to 
increase or enlarge the exposure of the vending machine. This is one of the way whereby three edges is actually being exposed to the uh, users and uh, other programs are being fitted inside. Next, uh, with uh, looking into the influx of city dwellers as an uh, interview by the one of the uh, and also the in, this, this is actually the project that is being uh, that's going to be held that's going to be developed in uh, the city the IIBD uh, uh, city development project whereby they are expected to have a uh, increase of living population meaning we uh, the site is really going to be uh, populated with uh, city dwellers and there's this need of in enhancing the urban health of the users. So looking at the site again, this is a plan view, and this is actually a bridge over here, one bridge over here, and another bridge over here. As I've mentioned earlier, the site is currently being uh, designed as a hub that connects the two, two, uh, the two streets. So um, Having the bridge as one of the design consideration, I was thinking, uh, what's the way? Could it could the bridge itself be a magnet that brings users in, or enhances their uh, experience while they are crossing? So the initial sketch uh, of the plan, the sections uh, surrounds uh, surrounds by the idea of the bridging, and I've also created this circular loop that is. Uh, that will be enhancing the experience of the vending machine. So yeah, the design is actually started by the linking of the bridge and the interplay of the masses in the, in the center. So, the, so it all uh, surrounds the, the circular uh, jogging path. And looking at this diagram, the vending machine is actually being brought to here. The idea is to here. Uh, I'm actually shifting it to an angle uh, facing the corners of this of the plot and creating this funneling effect that is uh, meant to focus the experience across the street. So the vending machine itself uh, serves like uh, a, a building or uh, urban furniture that is there, it's always there but it doesn't uh, affect your experience too much. So it's also a connector between the two streets. Then I've also um, integrated with the uh, flyover bridge that's connecting the buildings across the two streets and having this loop around to create this um, better experience. So the initial sketch, uh, initially I don't really, I can't really imagine how the building will look like. So this is actually the sketch of what I have. So my uh, suggestion is that if you have an idea, quickly sketch it out or uh, because oftentimes we will think an, an idea to the its very, very end, like to, to be very complete, then we only start uh, building it up, uh, start to fix it or something like that. But this is actually a view of it. As you can see, there's this uh, linking bridge over here, the circular uh, path they have created surrounding the building. And the building is over here on a perspective view. And this is this user, he can look down at the very ground floor, looking at the market and the people into, uh, connecting and socializing. Also, I've also uh, drew this something like uh, I've, like a cover, like a roof to the bridge itself. So this is where I continued my design of the bridge to better enhance or to finalize the design a little bit that suits the styles and design of the entire machine. So I was inspired by the uh, Renault distribution center with the tensile steel structure um, design. And finally, I've ended up with this design over here with, uh, with the fabric that is being uh, connected to one end of the uh, structure. 
and being arrayed along the entire, uh, I call it a, a jogging path. I will explain it later why. And also it's connected to this uh, breathing garden. As I've uh, mentioned earlier, there's this need of in enhancing the uh, urban health. So there's this garden that is available for the users. So on a plan view, it actually looks like, a, it looks uh, almost like a flower because of the use of this uh, ten tensile fabric structure. Then I also look into uh, the perspective view of the bridge of how it looks like and try to extrude it down seeing the possibilities of the building, how it actually could, um, could fit all the programs that I need. I also look into the uh, operable, uh, operable louvers, the details of it. And there's this marketplace at the very bottom, at, at the very ground level. And this is actually the final design of the building. It kinds of, it, it has the language of the, initial sketch, but without the building at the back, because this is before, way before I have the design of the uh, main, main building. So, the, uh, and we come to the third sickness, which is the entrepreneurs, or we can call them the young startups. We, uh, there's this uh, rising of this, uh, this certain group of users that they wanted to start uh, small businesses in the city center but they are facing few issues such as the high cost of rentals, as well as the need to expose their building, uh, their products and their businesses. So I've created a series of programs uh, dedicated for this group of people. So the first one is the HQ or the officers hubs. So this is where they, uh, the officers they can rent and it's built on this uh, but, uh, rigid, no rigid, sorry. Uh, it's like a gridded structure, gridded suit structure. So it's manipulable. I mean, they can uh, design the way they want it to be and then uh, to fit it onto this grid. And this is where they initiate the ideas. And when they have their ideas, they will need to prototype, prototype their products or services. So I've created a makerspace and this makerspace has the tools and the uh, uh, machines that that's that's a, that's able to let them to prototype their products or services. Then they need to display. They need to um, um, sell their products products and uh, services. So I've created this market market street that is meant to connect with the local people. And finally, if they are they have a more uh, larger audiences or they need a former space, there's this multi-purpose theater that is uh, also catered for them. So looking at the section, this is the, this is best to represent the idea of this, uh, this uh, program that is meant for the entrepreneurs. So looking at this side, which is the um, office hubs, so they, they generate ideas over, over here then they uh, prototype their products in the maker space and finally being displayed at the market street. So this is one of the way, or they could go to the uh, multi-purpose theater on, on the uh, upper floor to present it more formally. And yeah, after brainstorming all the medicines or solutions to the sickness, which is the vending machine, the linkages of the uh, jogging track, and also the startups for the young entrepreneurs. Uh, there's also this uh, integrated cure, uh, this cure that is uh, meant to further enhance the, and the medicine itself. So the first one is the so I have all these uh, ideas of putting all the programs together. And this is a sketch that I uh, imagined earlier. It's a complex integration, integration of all the programs, uh, stretching, stretching the ideas of select and choose. So at a glance, you can see all the programs that's uh, within the building. And it's, 
And then I've also created, uh, translated it into a conceptual uh, illustration, conceptual diagram. As you can see, starting from the uh, arrays of vending machines and adding in some uh, hill, fish pond, jogging track, uh, the supermarket, and the factory. And this is the final uh, diagram, final, final model uh, of the of the idea. So. Yeah, it's an integration of all the uh, all the ideas that I want to present. So, yeah, at first it's this is the final uh, exploded exonometric of the building. It is not that easy to create this uh, building due to the fact that it has a lot going on, and I struggled a bit during the design process as the there's there's too much space to work with and there's this there, we have this uh circular circular path we have the bridge we have the market theater and library and whatnot so at the end i've managed to create something like this my machine and let's walk walk you through uh, the floor plans so if you can see, um, it's uh, most of the uh, ground floor plan is actually being uh, being designed for the uh, basement parking. Then it comes to here. This is where the market street is. Market street is where the the uh, entrepreneurs will display their products or services. So it's this this design is actually uh, in intersection of all the main current uh, streets. So for example, the back alley is over here. It's actually connecting the uh, the users on the back alley to the main streets and also the pedestrian walkway over here. So if you can see from this diagram, it's actually linking the people. So sort, sort of giving a short, shortcut that uh, allows more interaction among the people. And for the program, um, I've also uh, said due, due to the rotation of the vending machine, this side is more uh, catered towards the old, old people as the um, short lots are actually occupied by the locals and the central central uh, machine is actually meant for the young locals. And to the first floor, we can see that um, this side, whereas, uh, is meant for the transient people where the tourists, the workers are, because they are used to this uh, walkway over here to cross the two streets to where they want to work or their point of attraction. So I've integrated, uh, I've uh, placed some food streets over here, some breathing garden and the linking bridge over here at this level. So uh, in a way to attract the current existing users through the food street instead of using the old uh, pedestrian walkway. Then to the second and third floor is where I've introduced the structural grid for the office office hubs. As you can see over here, this part is actually where the office hub is located. So um, it also have, uh, there's, there's, it's actually uh, segregated among uh, between the second floor and it's also the first floor. And this is where the jogging track is. I've called it a jogging track because uh, it's linking the um, the breathing garden. So I was thinking uh, perhaps we should also introduce uh, sports in the city so that uh, it's also a way to increase the urban health. And as we go up, we can see that there's this theater, double story theater, and also a living quarter. So what's a living quarter? Living quarter is actually where the, uh, we have this uh, sleeping pot, there's gym, there's yoga, a place for relaxation. There's also uh, climbing walls, and also some game, uh, game area for the users. As for the, and next I will go, into the environmental design or passive healing, how the building uh, works against or with the environment. 
So the building is shifted towards, uh, have the lower uh, shorter end, which is the uh, vertical circulation core facing the, uh, facing the sun, uh, facing the west and east sun. So it's actually blocking the uh, heat gain. So the building itself is much more cooler. And looking at the elevation, we can see that the use of material with a steel I-beam is integrated with a corrugated roof sheet, giving it a somewhat transparent uh, look to it. And also uh, the bending of this tensile structure, giving it a more uh, fluidity, a bit of, of uh, it's not too rigid in a way because it's being softened by the uh, tensile fabric on, on the structure. And this is uh, another view of the building. As you can see, the two bridges that linking uh, the two streets at different levels and uh, the selection occurs uh, everywhere especially uh, the users that's using the jogging track. Yeah, and this is actually the final renderings. Uh, the idea that's represented here is that besides, um, because using the steel structure itself is too, uh, too hard, somewhat it's, uh, it is, it is uh, relating to the urban context, but then, uh, in order to heal, I've also researched that there is this need of the use of uh, vegetation, the na natural elements. So I've integrated some greeneries, the roof, uh, the breathing garden, for example, and more and more uh, greeneries that's possible uh, at each level. So this is a view of the central courtyard, looking up to the uh, library, there's this vegetation all over, and as well as this uh, to the diagram on the right. This is actually a good representation of what I wanted at the very beginning, where you have, you can look at the building with one glance, look at all the programs, and you can look through this viewing deck down to the uh, maker space. You can look across the uh, center core to the uh, to the office hubs at the food hubs and also people across um, on the another end of the jogging jogging track. And if you look down, you can see people are talking, are integrate, uh, they are interacting at the market space. Yeah, so this is my final presentation layout. And yeah, so it's it's it really a great uh, great experience of uh, designing something like this. And this is a uh, illustration showing that some thoughts of mine after this, 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 uh, this process of designing this, this machine. Uh, there's too many things happening in the building. And during the final presentation, I was being asked, uh, what's the thing that I like the most? I, couldn't give a quick answer because there's too many things I am not really that focused. And this might be uh, not really great for the architectural uh, design because um, you don't have focus that let your audience to remember your building. So um, some, some suggestion from my side is that always have at least or not more than three main uh, focus of your design and stretch it through and design it according to, to these three main point so that, that people could uh, remember your building and it will be great. Yeah, so that's all from me. I will now pass it back to Lindsay. Hi Lindsay, are you around? Yes, I am here. Well, I just choked on my water because I saw your renders and I was like, whoa, what are those? <laughs> what? I mean, I don't really know how to say it, honestly. I'm just very mesmerized by whatever you showed on slides. And thank you, Koi, for sharing with us your complex, complex mind. 
and taking right. us a tour in your wonderland. That's amazing. I think Chingui keeps telling you to stop thinking because you're thinking too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just can't help with it. Yeah. I, I mean, just have to. I, I think this is yeah. maybe me working. Uh, this is my state of working when I start. Uh, it's, it, uh, somehow from this, I also learned that uh, we have to really have a time to stop ourselves. Mm -hmm. To always train mm -hmm. ourselves that oh it's time to stop it's time to stop and move on to the next thing, yeah okay. everything is a learning learning process I think. So next time we are here for you to tell you stop quiet stop please stop thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for me okay. That help. <laughs> all right um all right. well please teach me how you do that all next time um all right I'm gonna put you on right. hold first while I have Ryan speak and then I'll get you back with Shannon in a while and. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Well, let's have last but not least, guys. Let's have one of my dear friends, Ryan Sa, on our platform. Hey, hello. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. You're very early today. Not bad, huh? Hey, what? I'm the last <laughs> one to present, also. So it's not early. <laughs> Okay, la, not bad, not bad. You came in time. Anyways, could you share screen with us? Okay. Um. So I'll be sharing screen. Okay. I believe. Uh. I hope you guys are doing well, and I hope yeah. you guys have been uh, you know, with us since Friday. If you have, then you probably have seen architecture in many different forms. Uh. You know, starting from uh, whether it's installation, whether it's a structure collecting water, whether it's a healing machine, or performing art center. So sometimes it can't help to think that what makes us feel that oh, this is architecture, and what sets it apart from you know a building or a structure. So today, as a last presenter, uh, I would like to talk about how I perceive. I want to share about how I perceive architecture. Yeah, I think what the works that you see, what sets them apart from architecture is that there are certain ideals and meanings that are being embodied to the work, to the scheme. Uh, there's uh, these ideals and meanings encapsulated are there for us to experience, for the people to experience over time. And I find this side of architecture uh, particularly enticing to me. So here I would like to also share two of my works that is inspired in such manner. So the first one is uh, Behind the Wall. It's a visitor interpretive center. If you have heard Jet's presentation yesterday, I'm pretty sure you all know about the project brief, but I can't resist to share this because this is actually uh, one of the works that I'm exposed to uh, the extent and the capability of architecture in impacting us, not only on a practical level, but on an emotional level as well. So what's interesting about uh, this brief is the word interpretative. The interpretative meaning how visitors can, uh, how they interpret and perceive this uh, Mr. Interpretative Center. So in what form should it be? Uh, how should I, how should I let the visitors perceive this building? So when looking at the site, we already have a mini gallery housed within this multi-purpose hall. So the time, I can't help to think. Okay, so if I were to propose a visitor to produce center at here, what other things can I offer uh, that sort of elevates uh, or maybe uh, enhance what the gallery has? So looking at the site, they are, the site is strategically located at the center, surrounded by a lot of buildings uh, that play prominent roles to the, uh, uh, this leprosy valley of hope, this place, where the leprosy community carry out their daily activities in these places. And I actually took quite a long time to finally reach to a you know, uh, decision of what the, the intention of this uh, visitor interpretive center should be. 
So before that, I actually visited to the site a lot of times and then uh, interviewing a lot of uh, people. And what made me made my decision is through the interview with one uncle and one auntie. I can't remember their names, but the stories are quite, uh, it really uh, touches me in uh, quite deeply. One of it is about uh, how he was being put into the uh, into this settlement uh, un until he is in late 70. And another one is about how uh, she's a mother and how she has she is forced to separate uh, by policy and not being able to see her daughter. Uh, if you're not, I believe uh, Jet has explained about the history of the leprosy uh, and the settlement. But if you, in case you miss it, I will tell you again. So leprosy is in the time for about 100 years is an incurable disease. And then uh, it affects your nervous system, your skin, and the symptoms and the implications that you get is quite frightening. So a lot of people are, uh, are afraid of this disease and it causes sort of a stigma. So that time uh, they are forced to be quarantined at a place called Leposarium. And then in Sungai Bulu, uh, one of it is called Leprosy Valley of Hope. This uh, settlement is more like a sanctuary, I would say, rather than a quarantine place uh, where not only does it serve as a research base to develop cure, but it's also a place that is self-sustaining where people uh, grow plants and sell them to earn a living. So despite the pain and uh, the painful experience of segregation and discrimination that I faced, they soon found a sense of belonging uh, here, you know, in this uh, leprosy value of hope. And this is quite a, some, a first phase of the life in settlement, which is quite happy, I would say. And the sooner or later, uh, Debson was discovered. So this sprung up a, a greater hope for the leprosy community here. Because when uh, Debson was the first effective treatment to suppress the disease, and by the time, uh, eventually they were allowed to marry and then they are allowed to have children. Uh, by this, it means that they can finally have a family. Imagine uh, you know, uh, being detached from your family members. Things that used to be impossible, now uh, after so many years, finally uh, you know, they are able to do that again. So it's a milestone for them. And Chalets are becoming bigger, now they can house uh, married couples. So the thing is, but the thing is, they never expect what happened next. Uh, what I think what breaks us a lot is that we have such a high hope, but uh, in the end, things didn't turn out in our way. So uh, there's another policy in 1930 where they, because they didn't want they are afraid that the disease would spread to the next generation. So those married couples who have children are not allowed to keep their offsprings. Uh, in the first six months, they can only see their children once a week, if I'm not mistaken, and for several hours. Then after six months, this, uh, their children have to be sent out for adoption. I think this, this part in particular is what breaks me the most and the things that I want to capture uh, perhaps in this uh, Visitor Interpretive Center. So over the time, what they're trying to do is to, so the efforts of really waiting until their children grow up and then until eventually the disease has discovered, uh, sorry, the medicine, uh, the cure has discovered to, you know, to finally treat the disease that they can finally go and meet their offsprings and children. But because the children uh, didn't know about their parents because they are sent away so early from when they're young. So the way of finding back their offsprings is a difficult one. Uh, until recently, even myself, uh, before doing this project, I didn't know, uh, you know there's this leprosy settlement in Songhai Bulu. All I know is nursery, not until I uh, touched this project. So a lot of uh, the generations these days didn't really know about so to them, to really reunite to, with their children is one of the greatest yearnings. Uh. So that makes me want to uh, imagine what if, if we were to propose a visitor interpretive center 
uh, that could answer, uh, that could speak for them so that th their yearning can be answered. It would be great. I wanted to see faces like this, but you know, finally meeting back to, uh, finally being able to reunite. But at the moment, it is not possible. So to me, I, I think what, in what form should this Vista Interpretive Center be? What should it represent? So I decided to look at the timeline of the history and really extract the two important uh, things that caused all these tragic events, uh, which one of it is, okay, let me update. One of it is the segregation, you know, uh, segregation. And another one is due to stigma and as a result, uh, ostracism, which they are you know, separated further from the mainstream society. And then over the time, what they do is to yearn to return back to society, yearn to be united with their family members. So this informs the, the form of the overall uh, state of the center. And I wanted the experience to be you know, conveyed through to the visitors upon entering the entrance. Uh, my, one of my tutor once said that the experience of the, the building does not start within, but from the entrance itself. As you, before you enter the building itself, what you see already established uh, the form of experience. So at the entrance here, the wall is created with a slice to actually uh, to create the experience that someone stumbling upon you know, an unknown place that used to be blocked by the wall. And now that it is the site, now that it is being sliced and break, broken up, so things are getting revealed. What is behind is being revealed. So what lies behind the wall is actually, the first space is uh, the open gallery, I'll call it, in the form of a plaza stairs. Uh, that is placed above a community garden. So the community garden, apart from playing the role as a, uh, serving a commun communal space for the community to uh, spend their time here, it also becomes part of the contents for this gallery space. The, uh, hence the, perf the form of the space in such a permeable, uh, uh, permeable settings. And this is the open gallery in the form of plaza stairs ascending up. So basically, this gallery will be describing the first phase of the life in this leprosy valley of hope, which is adapting to a new environment and slowly tasting the uh, hope, slowly experiencing hope. Okay, so initially the idea is to, the community garden here uh, is to be integrated with the gallery. The sketch is that when people come uh, and hang out around the space, the visitors can actually see and engage uh, with the community. So the community becomes part of the, uh, the elements of the, the narrative that explains about uh, their life in uh, the settlement here. And also as uh, playing with the you know, scale of the stairs, widening up to the view and playing with levelings, as they ascend to the stairs, they start to see the context, uh, what's behind the, the basically uh, the, set, the settlement itself. Uh. And why is it, why is this shallot so important? Is that because shallot uh, determines living. Uh, as I mentioned before, when they you know, discovered Debson and eventually the cure, they are able to live together. The, what sets them from uh, normal place that they can't, they, they can't have family and they have to live alone. So seeing, uh, you know, seeing uh, this house are slowly built together, you know, forming a community and expanding to really house uh, a family is something that's very uh, promising to them. So at the highest point of this uh, open gallery, they can finally get a full glimpse of the shallots, you know, organized neatly and then with the explanations. And eventually this, uh, open, you know, this open gallery will be layered, you know, covered with the trees that's perforated from the community garden below. So it forms a very large and promising scene for them. So this is a place, I mean, this is the phase where uh, they really experience uh, 
great sense of hope and they start can't uh, can't stop to imagine can't wait to imagine oh one day i'll be able to go out you know and reunite with all the people that i all my family members my mother sister my children but what they did not expect is that uh, what awaits them is another segregation policy so on the upper floor is a contrasting indoor gallery which uh, is dark and closed and compressing is narrow as the journey continues so this is the uh, gallery to depict uh, what happens later uh, much of a uh, this uh, much of a sorrow that they experience in the later stages so all these writings uh, you know, uh, these are the stories told uh, from uh, in the by interviewing uh, the lap, the former lepers so written on the walls and with a rough texture and then the fenestration right behind it, uh, you know, revealing the views outside. This is a place to express that their efforts you know, to really get out of this place, to really you know, their yearnings to be part, be returning back to the uh, mainstream society. So at the end of this uh, open gallery, uh, this enclosed gallery, there's a view that frames outside uh, beyond the settlement. That is the ultimate yearning to represent the ultimate yearning of the leper situation. And what's more helpless is that they can see the visitors coming in, but the visitors actually don't really notice what's up there. It's like unheard voices that you want to reach to help, but it's not heard. So at the end of the day, they I would say they are forced to stay in uh, this uh, leprosarium. So before the visitors return to the ground floor, this is a view that frames back to the uh, open gallery and the community garden. And upon reaching ground floor, they will be in a, 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 a courtyard. You know, this is a place where there's this mixed emotion that accepted the faith, but whether should it be you know, happy or regret? Yeah, so hopefully at the end of the journey, this visitor the center could generate inner dialogue uh, within the visitors to really think uh, so that uh, now that they have understand what has what leprosy community have been through so what are their initiative to uh, you know to really break this segregation break this barrier and initiate some efforts to help them uh, to answer their yearnings i would say so it's about uh, conveying or narrating certain events through architecture, through the space and form to the people. So the next one would be, uh, this is a joint effort, it's a group uh, uh, submission for a competition called Green Innovation Design Com uh, Competition uh, together with Lindsay, Nabil and Eileen. So uh, this, is in a, this is a gazebo as you can see. And what, uh, what, we are, what I want to show is that architecture you know, doesn't really, uh, doesn't have to be confined in buildings. It can also be in other forms. So this is Kalibo uh, Sanjo and Homat. And the brief was to propose two uh, innovative Kalibo that is iconic, uh, sustainable, easy to build, and it has to fit for around 10 people within a three meter by three meter base. And this is a site of the, uh, it is for Taman Tugu project, a new uh, a proposed uh, urban park amidst Kuala Lumpur city center. So there are a lot of diverse programs happening here. And this makes us think that, okay, so what are we going to, you know, if we were to make, uh, if you want to have build something iconic. By the way, this is a build, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Kawarismi has mentioned about this uh, combination in his presentation. This is a build uh, combination, means, meaning the winning entry will be constructed. So the time we're thinking, okay, so if the truck, if the gazebo were to be built there, what should it mean? What should it express as an icon? 
So we look at the site again, it's through historical context, Tugu Nagara. So Tugu Nagara uh, is a statue about commemorating our soldiers who fought for us. So we say, uh, we try to find similarity. Okay, what gazebo and what soldier has in common? We come up with the sort of decision that the act of protecting. One is protecting us uh, from war, from enemy. Another one is sheltering us from the weather, the climate. So we thought maybe we could you know, uh, design this gazebo in a sense that it resembled, uh, resembled a soldier sheltering us. So the resemblance of a shoulder, uh, soldier. So how we uh, try to, uh, how we the design process, how we achieve that is that we start off with a, with a base and a column. This represents the body of the soldier. We call it a pillar of strength. So then we intersect it with a slab, which forms a shield for the soldier. And then we wanted to express uh, the act of protecting. So the expansion of shield uh, task is formed. And this expansion uh, informs the, the form, the basic form of our, both of our these uh, gazebo design, one for active, one for passive. So this cantilever roof, uh, functionally, it expands the usable space with a limited three by three to accommodate more users. And playing with the variation of skills uh, uh, and proportion of the, the elements of the roof and columns to suit the, to resonate with the activities that they facilitate in their respective zone. So the first one, active gazebo is more lightweight and it will be serving for the core. We name it the core, it's actually the center of the uh, park with a lake and an open space for events like picnic and stuff. Uh, whereas nearby here is an f &B outlet. So, and th there's an entrance here. So we anticipate a lot of users coming in from here to carry out uh, activities with various intensities. So the form itself is, uh, we, tr we try to make it uh, quite open to really celebrate the views and the activities happening around us. And regarding to the program that detail up to the design of the gazebo, so this gazebo has an L-shaped seating, different from the most of the gazebo that we see, which is you know just four sides or face to face. This L-shaped seating around, uh, allows for more diverse seating preferences so that the different groups of users can come and use without really feeling interfering other people's privacy or their place, whether it's for a group of friends or you know, two families with their kids. And the, due, uh, thanks to the open form, there's a uh, addition of features can also be made to really cater for more types of uh, usage. Uh, in this case is, you know, resting or really sometimes playing or resting, simply sightseeing. So on the other hand, gazebo format will be placed we propose to place along the spine. We call this the spine. It is a jogging trail as well as a cycling trail and a proposed bungee services trail for them that connects from the south entrance to the north entrance of the park. So different from the uh, Gazebo Sanjong is that if you can see the form is more heavy and enclosed. This is because uh, it is to cater for resting. So the metal lures here, uh, provides privacy for the jogger and cyclist to rest. At the same time, uh, serve, uh, serving as the storyboards as well as the uh, information boards of the Tamandugu and some of the, perhaps the uh, vocal uh, unwritten stories that shared by peers or friends of the soldiers in the past who told us. So, Again, it's about you know, uh, incorporating ideas and meanings to the design and really you know, portraying it to its user, to the people in this place. So, and then uh, at night, uh, well lit, both are well lit so that throughout day and night, people can really appreciate this structure. More much like uh, throughout, day, throughout day and night, they are protecting us. So that's the end of uh, 
what I would like to share in talking about what our topic is revolving around in this uh, graduation exhibition event, concept, culture, and context. Well, I think uh, this forms the layers of meaning to architecture. And depending on uh, appropriateness, I would say, uh, most of the time it is, uh, I would say, uh, architecture will be appreciated if the concept culture or context that it represents expressed is experienced by the public. At the end of the day, we are designing the public. So I, to me, I think architecture is a habitable form of expression that adds value. By saying habitable form of expression also means that we can really experience it. So I think architecture can be a lot of things, but not everything can be architecture. So perhaps when we start to design something next time, maybe we want to ask ourselves, uh, you know, what architecture really is for that particular context, for that particular people, for that particular culture. Yeah, so this is what I would like to share with all of you and thank you for listening. Wow, senpai. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Hello, hello. How are you feeling? Are you feeling um happy that you get to you know share both of your works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> it was a challenge but, though. I thought I couldn't, you know, within the limit of time. But I, I yeah, still want I was, to share it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think we enjoyed all of your projects that you, you just mentioned. All right. Uh, now let's have the three musketeers back on board. Shannon and Koi, are you there? Hi. Hello. Hello. Wow, all the senpais. I cannot tahan. <laughs> oh, no, no. Hi, guys. Hey. So, um, sorry, a bit overwhelming, you know, these three very mm. smart Good looking boys, just you know, right in front of my screen. But okay, the first question we have is um, a lot of people want to know if you guys are single or not. So if you are single, could you just put your thumbs up? If you're not, then don't put your thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ryan, where's your thumb? I, I was doing, but I can't see. Oh, <laughs> yes, I didn't. The coin is taken, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, quite you, I think. Quite, quite, yeah, it's, yeah, I am taken. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so what do you think about all of, the, um, all of your projects? I mean, you guys were listening, right, to each other's projects? What do we think? What do you guys think? It's very informal, so... What do you think? Just saying, what do you think? <laughs> me? Yeah. Well, I think that all of you are really made out of another species, okay? <laughs> Something that is not part of the human race. I don't know. You guys are just really talented, really smart. It's, it's just awesome. I'm just very over, overwhelmed by all of your works and projects. So what do you guys think? What the, Okay, what does Shannon think about Koi and Ryan? Uh, I think that Project. both of them definitely went through a lot of like trial and error. I think they definitely uh, sharpened their skills along throughout the semesters. And I think they found their footing in what they're good at. Lah. I think Ryan's mm -hmm. really like a poetic designer. Every time he tells a uh, project, he always includes a story into it. And, and, and that story tells, ties well into his architecture. And as for Koi, uh, I've seen him, his projects throughout, and he has this complexity within his mind. And I think in semester six, he really got a hold of that complexity and managed to tell the story out in a informed, not informed, uh, in a in a cohesive manner. La. So I think, yeah, la, crazy like why he's complex. <laughs> I mean. Right. I, oh shit, my boy. Right. I mean, <laughs> I saw all of his drawings and stuff, and I was actually choking on my water just right here. I was very overwhelmed. I think that also. Yay. There, there is certain poetics in Koi's work in the tectonic composition. I think poetics is not just about you know space, light, and stuff. Again, it's, it's, it's the meaning, you know, it's why you put it 
in that way and how yeah. you know, it, agree with right expressing yeah. it in a way that the people can understand and appreciate and that, that is a narrative and that is the mm-hmm. quite a part of architecture i think yeah i think i think this is a very important lesson that we learn through architecture mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. uh having a reason behind all the actions or the design that we uh, thought of that we incorporate in the building that is uh, in, uh, finally will be uh, um, affecting the end users right correct right, correct well said well said okay um, the next question we have is what makes you so passionate in architecture and what do you guys do to keep the drive going so let's start with shannon okay. <laughs> uh, not gonna lie like i i kind of like stumbled into architecture um and i'm pretty sure like uh the, the other two of them also did mm. i'm not too sure about ryan but i'm pretty sure quite was like similar ideas in mine uh but we saw i saw a stumble into architecture but i really enjoyed this uh design process also of like a, a research base uh combined with the idea of an out, out, outlet of uh, creative energy. And I, I love stories, like I love movies and I love uh, reading stories when I was younger. I don't read anymore now, sad, sad thing to say. But yeah, I think architecture is a great means of storytelling in that sense where um, you always have a start and a finish in terms of a user experience. Um, but even if you're not telling the story of the user, the users are telling their own story by going through your building themselves. So each time a user goes through a building, they're, they're making their own story up. And I think that's a really powerful part of architecture. And I also see architecture as a tool of, of change. Up. So yeah, I'm excited to see what else I can venture into architecture to create change within our world today. Wow, okay. That's a very nice answer. Okay, how about uh, Koi? I think it's the... Um, the passion is due to the desire to design, to create. Because uh, previously I was reading through this uh, idea whereby having the power to create or to form something, it's really, uh, really great. Because you are making something and anyhow, the thing itself will have this uh, impact to people. And I think having that power it's really, uh, it's really something that, uh, that will make make a better, better, uh, better to the people, to the environment. Yeah, basically, it's the design. I like to design stuff. I like to create. I like to uh, form something. Just like this project I've done, uh, I have so many things that I want to do. I started to create it out and find out there's new uh, new problems to solve, which is to glue them up together. And also uh, part of this problem solving, I also quite like to solve problems. Yeah. I also like sketching, drawing, drawing things. Just like the, the, the idea I've uh, mentioned earlier, the power to create. Uh, making like uh, baking is also creating something right sketching drawing and there's really a lot of things that is uh, that can be related to this uh, this power of create power to create <laughs> yeah yes yes understand okay how about uh, Ryan yourself well I Architecture excites me is because uh, I realize the you know, capability of architecture in leaving an impact to us. Because uh, whether it's big or small, whether it's individually or as a collective, architecture shapes the built environment we live in. And by that, yeah. it subsequently will shape the way we live and therefore, to a certain extent, the way we perceive things. I think it's quite magical and fascinating to think that how what we create, you know, in the end affects us and affects people. And, but, and architecture is a broad field to study. It's not just about design. It's about, you know, there are a lot of other things, structures, science behind it. I 
these are the things that I wanted to explore and find out and exploring ways to integrate them together, coming up with new form of built environment, I would say, not architecture, built environment that you know, people could really cherish and uh, celebrate. That's why mm. I wanted to pursue this. Oops. Sounds Very more sweet. like urban design, yeah, but I think architecture forms the block of urban design. So architecture is mm. quite important. Very nice, very well thought answer. Great, okay. Um, well, next question we have uh, for Shannon. This is directed to Shannon. And also, can you talk more about how architecture can improve the safety of a place? What are the actions that we can take? Mm, I see. Well, I think there's mm. two different things. There's definitely safety and the other thing is a sense of safety. So even though your place might be safe, uh, the reputation of the space might make it feel unsafe. So if your town, you guys have a lot of uh, snatch, theft, uh, snatch, theft, snatch thefts around the area and that mm -hmm. reputation itself make it unsafe. So I guess architecture can do just a little bit. It doesn't solve the issue entirely, but being open and transparent in architecture, uh, having a lot of people uh, watching over you at all times. So allowing mm -hmm. the building to be permeable is, was the strategy I used and having the multiple decks protruding so that people can constantly watch over you. So whenever there is a crime happening, you know that people are always watching within a city. And if the city is more and more populated, the city feels safer. The more abandoned the city is, it definitely feels less safer. So I think that's why I uh, emphasize so much on putting a public realm within my building. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. That's good, that's good. Okay. Um, next question is for Koid, the healing machine. It seems like so many things is happening at once. How can you ensure that people there or even Johorians to accept the complexity and how can you convey your message to the users as in you think that there is several sickness and in this, sorry, and this, the healing, and this is the healing machine for them? Question mark. Yeah, um, probably the first, the first thing they want to answer is that um, how do I, uh, identified that the Johor is actually in a way sick is that the, the initial idea is from the river. Actually, there is this river, uh, Saget River, that is uh, that used to be uh, in our site, on our site, just right beside the uh, main road. But then due to the pollution, due to the construction development and stuff, it's being covered and uh, it's being polluted and not being used. So somehow that is actually, um, I, I, I see it as a neglectance, neglectance of the uh, his, history and the culture. And because that's the start of Johor, Johor Bahru, the river brings in people and uh, Johor is, is now, is how it is today. So that is the first, first uh, initial idea, thoughts of why I think that the, the, the the city is sick, just like it's reflecting, reflected by the uh, status of the river. So that's that's one thing. And the other issues, I sort of uh, see it as an issue as well, because the transient people is actually really an issue. Uh, I forgot about the, the river. The people are not um, appreciating the culture on site. So I think this is really uh, going to defeat the survival of the of the current state of the uh, the cultural uh, cultural and heritage uh, essence. So yeah, these these are all the ideas I have in mind previously. And for the complexity, it's uh, perhaps my drawing itself is portraying portraying that complexity, but uh, having it. Uh, in real life, probably, uh, if possible, or, or uh, imagine it in real life, it's that uh, it's meant to attract people in a way that adapt to uh, adapt, attracting by adapting. Just like mm -hmm. the transit people, they have no time, so I've created this building, this machine, to let them, uh, to, to adapt to them, to their lifestyle, to their perception, so they can use it more, uh, easily and more yeah in their way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep wow okay 
Well, guys, this is a sneak peek in his mind. It's, it's very complex, but also very smooth. Okay, uh, next is a question for Ryan. Uh, someone named AZ, AZ um, has joined me in our um, live stream. So she was asking, what is your concept of your first project? Concept? Uh, actually, I wouldn't define... Now, this is an interesting thing. I, you know, always the term in between concept, intention, idea, and, and so on and so on. I think uh, I, would much, I would much say that the intent of the Mr. Interpretative uh, Center is that it wanted to serve as a portal uh, uh, that brings visitors to a journey to discover the isolated emotional role of leprosy patients. Mm -hmm. That is the intention mm. and okay. concept perhaps is, I would say, how do I achieve it? You know, uh, by using, by really extracting the site. Uh, the concept is like a representation of the situation of the leprosy settlement there. I would mm. I mean this way, yeah. Mm -mm. Okay, I hope that answers your question, A A Z view viewer. Um, okay, so our next question is, can the speaker share an overview of the workshop they will be conducting next week? Coit and Ryan, you guys are not just future thinkers, but you guys are also um, instructors of workshops, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> what's, the, what's the question again? <laughs> Um, can the speakers share an overview of the workshops they will be conducting next week? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I will go first. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll be conducting a SketchUp workshop next Sunday, uh, 25th of uh, July. Uh, basically, I'll be uh, teaching SketchUp as a tool. Uh, it's actually a very easy to use tool, but then without understanding the concepts of modeling behind SketchUp, we it's actually quite hard to maneuver and really to produce something uh, to our advantage. So I'll be uh, introducing the concepts of modeling and to teach how uh, also using it as a design process tool mm -hmm. to develop design setting views and studying spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And finally, how about mm -hmm. to make diagrams? You know, exporting it for post production. Just nice. Nice. Yes. Nice. If, if I was a junior, I'd definitely sign up for your class. So uh, all the juniors, do you hear that? Uh, we're very senpai, Ryan Sub. We'll be having a workshop, please. Go and sign up. Um, we will link it down in our description box, or we'll also link it in our YouTube chat. So make sure you check that out. Um, how about Shannon? You're also teaching a workshop, right? Yeah, um, I'm teaching a workshop for Revit. And uh, basically, I've been doing my projects all in Revit from semester three onwards. And that's because I believe Revit is the most efficient in terms of its workflow. So I'll be teaching yeah. everybody about an efficient workflow of how I start a project uh, from, from the drafting towards exporting to CAD and how I can translate that into my final presentation boards. And this includes the making of families, um, the idea of uh, uh, shortcuts and all the little tips and tricks we have along the way. And I think many people are afraid of Revit, but uh, it's because of the parametric uh, limitations but Revit is parametric because parametric means inputting and then you get a, a very fixed output and that's literally Revit law. Mm -hmm. I always thought that Revit was very um, rigid you know mm. right but yeah. hopefully um, anyone who also thinks that and after um, attending Shannon's class or workshop you'll have this smooth outcome of how Revit actually works. Okay, how about Koi? You're also another instructor? Yeah, I am teaching uh, Photoshop as in how to produce uh, renderings, post-productions mostly. Um, I will start from a uh, model trying, to, uh, I try to teach how to capture views in your digital model, capture the right views that uh, express uh, the ideas behind your concept and how to further enhance it through the post-production in Photoshop. Mm, okay, yeah. very nice. Um, can I ask a question? I mean, personal question. All your renders, right? How long do you take to 
render. <laughs> like your Photoshop uh, skills looks amazing. So um, yeah, how long does it take for one render, one perspective, the killer perspective? The killer, actually my uh, killer is actually like a long straight of to a, 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 a one, a one bot stick okay. together. Uh, I think I, I took two days. The first day is to trying out because the first day I, I, I need to uh, find the correct views and then put it in, try the colors and stuff, the composition especially. Wow. And the second day to really finalize it. Yeah. Nice. But actually this, this, wow. this style is not, uh, not, not the one that I have previously. I was uh, looking mm -hmm. in realistic rendering, mm -hmm. and but then I think that it doesn't work. I really, uh, tr as I was uh, progressing or building my uh, digital model, I keep on trying new styles, rendering styles that really fits the uh, the final outcome, the mm -hmm. final yeah. outcome, the final idea that I right, want. Right. Wow, two days. It's so that's very like, long. Right. I. I'm still amazed that you can still make it for uh, finals back then, right? Okay, um, next question. I mean, following that question, um, I see that you guys all have different rendering um, outcomes, right? Like for Court yourself, I mean, for your final project, you had a very collage style, right? Uh, for yeah. Shannon, I think it's a little bit more realistic. I would say you've used Lumion. Yeah. Yeah, and then for Ryan, it's also a little collage, but a different texture to how Koi um, portrays his work. So um, the question is, do you have any tips for rendering and how do you, uh, would you suggest our juniors to find their own rendering style? Uh, I think rendering is a method of representation. For how I approach rendering, I usually see uh, the brief and I first, determine who are the audience is, uh, who, are, who am I designing to, uh, and, uh, yeah, and what is it for. So for the uh, BIC, because I was telling a story about the you know, isolated emotional role uh, of the leprosy community, something that's unheard of. So it wouldn't make sense to make it realistic render. So I wanted to make it as if something whimsical and in a storytelling format. Therefore, I opted for a more collage, more graphical style of you know, portraying mm -hmm. the entire journey of the uh, Easter in the Play Center. Whereas for the gazebo, because it is going to be a built structure and it involves mm -hmm. public voting, so realistic render here really helps to visualize uh, how it will look like when it's built. So I think uh, the way of approaching, uh, I wouldn't say uh, what style you want to choose or you want to master. I think, of course, the more style you know and can do, the better it is. So you can represent your work in a different way to different types of people, uh, to, uh, to, diff to different audiences. So the thing is uh, really, again, it's about appropriateness, uh, whether or not uh, this thing, right. you can convey your idea to the person or the group of people you want to convey to. Right, right. Definitely agree on that. I mean, it's not about what is your rendering style, but how you can really communicate your design, the feeling of your project to the other party, right? Okay. Um, how about Koi? Um, for me, I think like architecture is also part of design. We could always use the design principles to uh, like capture our renderings. Mm -hmm. For example, like if you have... For example, the, the, the screen is showing Shannon's uh, the archway. It's like a repetitive uh, element that you want to represent. It also, it, it, it can be one way to uh, to focus your rendering. Like uh, if you want to uh, focus uh, the skill and hierarchy, uh, saying that, uh, showing that your building is a massive one or a small one, like, uh, like Ryan's, Ryan's uh, rendering there, you can see that it's actually quite, uh, quite, quite harmonious. It's quite uh, human scale. Yeah, design, design for human. And another thing is perhaps can uh, 
not really always look into the architectural renderings that the social media has. Maybe look into real life photos, like how they capture the interior of a space, the two point perspective, one point perspective, and some uh, drone shot, bird eye views, perhaps. That's also one way to, uh, to create your rendering uh, that is more realistic in a way that it's a human eye level. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah, that's some of the tips and tricks. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, how about Shannon yourself? Yeah, I, I agree quite. Um, I, I struggle with perspective, so look at real life photos. And perhaps just one short thing to mention is uh, always take note of your foreground and your background. What's happening in your foreground uh, and your background should be populated as well. And these photos should reflect reality in some sense. Uh, I can recommend you guys a couple of YouTube channels. Maybe you mm. can check, uh, either show it better or Arqui9, Arqui9 visualization. And they do a lot of Arqui critical renderings uh, in terms of realistic renderings. And they'll point out all your tips and tricks much better than I can because I'm not that great at renderings, to be honest. Okay, okay. Uh, what's it called again? One uh, Arqui, is it? It's called Arqui. A R Q U I nine visualization. Okay, okay, we will put that on the YouTube chat, and then so that everyone can see. Okay, so um, I think that's the end of our Q and A session. Thank you guys so much for coming up and participating in the alumni. In, I mean, in the alumni sharing session, we really are overwhelmed by all of your works. Um, so. I definitely will miss you guys. So I'll see you guys soon. So yum cha soon, okay? All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll see you later. All right, bye. 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 All right, guys, um, before we head towards the end of the event, I'd like to thank our fellow sponsors, um, Taylor's University, our official printer, Angel Printing House, and our collaborator, Blanc Collective. Now, if you are a student again, please do follow Taylor's Uni for some updates pertaining academic courses. All the information are linked down below. So do head on to their FB page and give them a like, especially if you're a student Taylor student especially. Um, and if you're an architecture student, you'll find yourself already um, following Angel Printing House. But if you haven't, please do follow because you definitely want this as one of your options when you are um, in the midst of submitting your work. Okay, so another note, if you are interested in aesthetics, fashion, and jewelry, you can always head on to Blanc.Collective on Instagram and hit them a follow. They curate a range of aesthetics from jewelry to more products coming up soon. So please do follow them and make sure you stay tuned. Um, since it's gonna be the last day, bear with me another minute as I shout out our most amazing merchandises designed by our team. They have spent blood, sweat, and tears. Okay, blood, sweat, and tears. It's like a submission to us um, in designing very practical designs for all of you. So please do head on to our website to shop for our customizable t-shirts, one of which I am again wearing. So am I C underscore question mark. So you you see the underscore, you can actually fill in any customizable uh, names or words. So please do so. I think that's very unique on our, uh, on our, on our end. So Terrazzo earrings, uh, which I'm also wearing. Um, we also have tote bags and sketchbooks and many, many more. The more exciting news that you guys are that I'm so excited to tell you is that we are currently having a flash sale. Those who don't know what a flash sale means, you guys are missing out. It means you can get all our merchandises for cheap, 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 like Lelong, okay? We have combo deals, as you can see below, having a reduction of price only from 19th to the 21st of this month. I repeat, only from today till the 21st of this month. We have amazing combos in store for you from bundle sets and more and also note that today is the last day to customize your tea and tote bags at only 15 ringgit okay so cheap 15 ringgit and you get to customize any words on 
your tote bag and also your t-shirt. Last day, yeah, guys. I haven't customized my tote bag yet, so I'm definitely going to do that later. So make sure you do too. Some options you can choose from are the words probably so am I chatty, so am I chill, so am I a champion, so am I crafty, and many more. Okay, so remember, again, today is your last day to customize. Remember. <laughs> okay, also, if you don't want to get them in combos, you can always get them at a la carte prices. We have our exhibition booklet, which consists of 90 plots of the projects by our students not our students, I'm also one of the students, by our classmates throughout our degree years will be on sale as well as for every item on um, the slide that you see. So our booklet here will be on sale at 50 ringgit only from 65 to 50 ringgit, okay? So it's a 15 ringgit discount, okay? So you definitely want to get that, right? I mean, it's... Always good to have a hard copy of your works and or your seniors work for references and all that. So it's a book of memory. So my classmates, please buy these books. And for juniors, please have it in your library so they can always peek in and look at our design strategy. Coit, Shannon, Ryan, Jed, Erna, all our future thinkers and Dinsley students. Uh, projects are all up there. So you can go ahead and buy it and read it for your own. So do um, go to our website now at taylorsartgrad.com to purchase now. All the links are linked down in the description box below or you can check the YouTube chat. Um, our team will definitely um, link the link down there now. So make sure you check it before it's all gone, okay? Oh, also, if you can see our flash sales, oh, flash sale includes t-shirts from 30 ringgit to 25 for both white and black shirt. Uh, for postcards, we have it at 12 ringgit now. You have all nine design postcards by us. Stickers at eight ringgit. Um, for your tote bag, it's only, wow, it's only 20 ringgit. 20 ringgit for the colored tote bag and also the white tote bag. Where can you get these kind of tote bags? I think nowadays tote bags are like 40, 50 ringgit, right? So, and this ones are customizable as well. Okay, and you have earrings at 30 ringgit per pair only. Actually, the earrings are 60 ringgit per pair on original price, but now we have made it 50% discount. So please go and check it out. All right, so now as all of you may already know, today is our last day of making you wake up so early in the morning to watch and to... Uh, see all these exciting events that we have, but we are very happy to have all of you on our platform participating and supporting us from wherever you are. We have specially prepared a closing ceremony from wherever we are as well. So without further ado, please, please enjoy by yours truly. But it's sad to say this, man, but it's time to say our goodbyes. Cue drops. Anyway, we really learned a lot throughout the preparation of this event. From the postponement to the shifting of physical to virtual event. Most definitely. And we couldn't have done it without your support. Truly, everything from purchasing our merchandise to attending our virtual talks, we couldn't have done it without you. We hope that we will have enjoyed the lecture session as well as the projects that we have published on our website. And of course, we can't forget our team. We saw this event through and through from the very beginning of planning it until seeing it come through live on your screens. It's just such an amazing process. Definitely, it's the good collaboration among us, the organizers and the committees that have got us through this hard time during the pandemic. Hey, Koi, just wait a second. Let me call up someone. Hey. Hey, Mr. Prince. Mr. Prince, how are you? Time for 
flies so fast and we're now on the final day of the graduation exhibition. I'm sure the three days has been a very memorable one. Again, I would like to thank and congratulate the very hardworking and creative organizing team headed by Koi and Shannon. Okay, please give them a round of applause. Job well done, guys. Congratulations again. As a closing remark, I would like to share a very short um, speech, a short message for our graduating group. Keep the positive attitude and energy in anything you do in life. Architects are the most optimistic people on earth. It is not bad. At least we have something to motivate us to go up in bed, stay at night, and challenge us to think all throughout the day. May you be equipped with what you have learned and maintain the fire burning to always strive for the best, believe with all your might, and thrive on all your endeavors. As a familiar quote says, sometimes you will never see the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. May you treasure the three to four years that you stayed in Taylor's and learn from each day's experience or experiences. We, your ADP lecturers, and all your previous mentors will treasure each day spent with you, guiding, reminding, bestowing the right amount of confidence and knowledge to fuel you to keep on going in the future. Good luck and looking forward to see you all successful in your own ways. Remember, an architect who says it can't be done will always find himself interrupted or bothered by someone doing it. We believe that each of you can be the architect who can prove nothing is impossible to accomplish. All the best and congratulations again. Thanks so much, Mr. Prince. But this wasn't a solo effort, far from it. So we got to give credit where credit is due. Let's give it up for our team. And last, last but not least, I would like to introduce the people who have been working behind the scene as well as in front of your screens. Yep, just like our theme of So When I See, we are collectively one whole with different individual and unique parts. And all of us play a special and unique part within this huge family. We wish you all the best and see you soon in the near future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, now let's have all the organizing committee up on Zoom. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, how's everyone? Can everyone give me a thumbs up? Okay, guys, this, <laughs> one by one, um, hi, guys, now this is our full organizing committee. This is the, th the team behind all the amazing organizing to design to everything that you see on our social media, um, to so much blood, sweat, and tears for almost more than half of you are planning, right? I just want to say thank you guys so much. The entire event would not have been so successful without you guys. So, again, Dr. Hamida. All right. Let's say bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Let's take a group, group, group photo. Oh, okay, let's take a group photo. Yes, yes, definitely. Oh, stop, man. How are? How do? Um, let's have someone screenshot. Who's gonna screenshot? Shannon. Oh, but we're, it's okay. I'll just take from the YouTube list. Uh, okay, okay. I'll screenshot. Okay, everybody, small, huh? This is last time we did. Okay, one, two, three. 
All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Okay. Wow. Honestly, seeing everyone up on the platform just makes me feel like time has flown by so fast. Don't leave just yet, guys. Don't leave just yet. I got my own speech as well. <laughs> okay. Um, okay wow sorry for that glitch a little bit <laughs> okay um well i have my own speech so i'm just gonna say something um seeing everyone up on the platform just now makes me feel like time has flown by so fast from graduating last year to coming down, I mean, coming together despite our busy schedules, overcoming the hurdles of being the first batch to test out a virtual exhibition due to the pandemic to finally being able to see our blood, sweat and tears being appreciated by all of you who are watching right now. Uh, we just wanna especially thank everyone who has been involved in this and all the community members, um, supporting lecturers, our sponsors, vendors, and most, most importantly, to all of, all of you who are watching right us, I mean, watching us right now. Um, thank you so much for making it all happen for us. This is August 2019's exhibition architecture batch exhibition who we call ourselves the Archirex. Not sure why we call ourselves Archirex, but I'm pretty sure it's because architecture really did wreck us all up. Um, but through though in all these years of being together as one of the biggest batch of over 130 individuals of of different backgrounds, different personalities, different culture um hold on mm -hmm. different cultures different cliques with different opinions and design we not only have broken our boundaries of differences but have to learn to accept another um another one's differences and becoming one family so i can definitely say um all those sleepless nights uh back to back submissions morning lectures that we have slept through don't tell me you did not. Um, having hot pots in studio and bringing an electrical stove, right? Quite, I know you did. Uh, sleeping bags and all the shenanigans and drunken nights that we had after submissions that we only that will only make us laugh at ourselves in a few years time missing the student life that we all had. Um, I hope we all will cherish this moment and memories that we only get once in a lifetime and continue to keep in touch even as life takes us by. Um, just a little note to all our QREX, okay, to all my friends now that are watching and the community members, let's keep our year-end party gathering a tradition going on until we're gray and old. Okay, this is our next project and the project brief will be out soon by yours truly. So to be continued. Okay, and one more thing, we have prepared a little surprise for all of you Archirex and everyone who's watching us right now to walk down a little memory lane. So please enjoy it. the 
Okay, now that was a very emotional video, right? I would say, I mean, I can cheer it a little. <laughs> well, I will really miss you guys so much. Um, before we really end, we like to invite all of you to a live performance by Adam and Hannes. A duo that promised to entertain. All you need to do is head on to our Instagram at SoMIC underscore to watch now. All our links and committee members' Instagram handles are also down below. So make sure you follow them and their architecture documentations. All right. So again, my name is Lindsay and it has been a great opportunity to be your MC for the event. So now signing off and wishing all of you best in all of your future undertakings and have a blessed, blessed day ahead. So see you next time. Bye. Who else is here? I have no idea. Okay. Dumb, don't you dare. If we get to 20 viewers, we can start, I guess. No, I don't know. I'm just waiting for the queue. No, we have queues now? We have queues. Oh, we're there! Okay, so we can start, I guess. Alright, so hi, my name is Hanis. To my friends watching, this is Adam. Peace. Yeah. So, um, as y'all might know, I perform a lot for SABD. So I suppose this would be my last performance for SABD. And um, it sucks that I can't do it live, like, you know, physically, but yeah. We'll deal with this. So our first song is gonna be I'm so nervous. Our first song is gonna be Self Control by what's his name? Frank Ocean. By Frank Ocean. <laughs> okay, I hope you guys enjoy.
nose is on a rail Little virgin, where's the way? You cut your hair, but you used to live a blinded life Wish I was there, wish we'd grown up on the same advice And our time was right Instead of behind a camera, so it's still very nerve-wracking. Yeah, but but since since we're in a buffer period of talking right now, why don't you tell why don't you tell the audience about your last year of being a architect student? How's that like? Um, <laughs> why do you have to ask all the hard questions, lah? Fuck. Okay. Okay, <laughs> susah sangat. Susah <laughs> Um, it was fun. I wish I spent more time with my friends though. So, for my juniors who I know you guys are watching somewhere in there, please make the most of your last year because working is not fun, okay? It's not fun yeah. at all. Well, that's just depressing, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, we only have two songs for you today. Our second song is going to be um, Karen O's The Moon Song. Mm. Yeah. And it goes somewhere like this. Oh 
enjoyed our three-day graduate exhibit so am i see um all our youtube videos and lives are available on the channel which is um i mean if you're watching from youtube which is this so yeah and please visit our website to
the lock but lost the key Guess I set you free I hope you found a place to sleep I know you're bound to think of me Ouch.